Pete. Hello. Oh, hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Well, it's, lo it's lovely to finally meet you. Thank you for including me. It's wonderful. I mean, your story, I can't wait to hear it, not only about Tina, but also to get into you uh, know, your own life story, which I discovered is so remarkable. So uh, there are, yeah, there are many blessings. It's been, it, it has been and continues to be, to be an extraordinary life lovely you know just and now because i'm 74 now so i mean it's um being able to look back and see how things developed and to see sort of the bigger picture because when when you're just growing up you're just doing it you know i mean you can one can appreciate that yes this is great and, you know you it's a privilege all of that but then when you get to a certain age and it becomes finite you know it's not like oh i'll do it in 10 years time oh i'll do it in 20 you know you don't know you know, you don't know if you have tomorrow. So, but age is, you know, is amazing. It's just a number. I mean, some people, mm -hmm. they age quickly. And then some people like you, mm -hmm. and obviously, I Tina. Feel, but... I feel like I'm I feel like I'm just beginning, you know, yeah. anyway. Do you still sing classically because your voice is beautiful. And oh. I know I know you've had classical training initially. Yes, does that, I does did. that appeal to you or not? Oh, absolutely. It does. It was what I originally started with, actually. But I yeah. I kind of wanted to sing rock and roll and sing, you know, okay. avant-garde stuff, but yeah. then use that classical voice in there. Yeah. Uh, you know that for being a ballet dancer. Mm. You have to be on point. You have to really yeah. have great work mm. ethic. Mm. And it was too structured for me at that time, actually. I see. So that's but the, the range. Your, your range is, is beautiful because... I mean, it's baritone in the middle, but the the deep. I mean, it go, it goes. It, it's beautiful. Um, Thank you so much. I'm it, so honored. Hi, everyone, and welcome to my show, The Lucas Alexander Show. I'm Lucas Alexander in Copenhagen, Denmark. It's the 9th of January, 2024, and this is part of my special tribute series, Remembering the Queen of Rock, Tina Turner, who sadly passed away last year on May 24th, 2023. Today, I am joined by a very special gentleman. I have a great guest on who knew Tina very well. He was a costume designer for Tina during the 1970s, from 1973 to 1984, during the days of the Ike and Tina Turner Review. He is the famous gentleman who did her legendary rag dresses. He also became a very close friend of Tina. We're going to go very in-depth. We're going to hear his amazing story. And he's an esteemed and great talent in his own right as a ballet dancer, as a cabaret artist and singer, and of course, as a costume designer. It's my pleasure to welcome on my show, Christian Holder. Welcome to the show, Christian Holder. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Um, I've been looking forward to today. You know, it's um, it's a thrill. And Tina was such a huge presence in my life that it's lovely to have the opportunity to, to speak about all the adventures we had together and how she came into my life, which was an extraordinary happening, a spiritual happening. It was wonderful, wonderful. 
it's so exciting and we have so much to talk about here on mm. the show today and and your and your life story with Tina first of all but before we go into all of this amazing history there please um address you know her passing and what she leaves behind what what in your opinion will be the legacy of Tina Turner and what did she mean to the world of show business obviously, but also to the world in general. Well, it's just this mega, mega, mega contribution and um, and loss. But in the loss, there is bequeathed um, this enormous gift. In the practice um, of Nichiren Buddhism, there is um, something we call actual proof. You literally see before your eyes the, the practice working. And for me, that was Tina, her life. Well, when when we first met, um, the whole situation, the whole setup was so unusual. And it just went on from there. And at the time, I knew it was special. Um, but now that I look back on it, I see how profound it really was. Um, and obviously there's so many different um, stories being written and um, people coming forth and talking about sort of dissecting her life and putting it in different contexts. And Renge is the, um, is the, is the lotus. It blossoms from the swamp, from mud, from, you know, the dregs. And from that emerges this beautiful, beautiful flower, which um, seeds, it, it drops its seeds and it blossoms simultaneously. Usually it's one in a season, does one or the other. And the lotus um, does both simultaneously, which is sort of um, eternity. You know, it can, it's, it's, it, it's, it's the cycle of life. And for me, that was, that was Tina. You're also practicing Buddhism. Yes, with Tina, and this was 1975, and I didn't act on it immediately um, because I thought that I knew her life was in turmoil, and I felt that I was doing okay. So I, I wasn't being arrogant. I just thought, well, you know, okay, fine, you know, et cetera. I, I, she planted the seed, I heard it, et cetera. It wasn't until, uh, this was in New York, it wasn't until I came home to London in 2009, um, I was at a um, an Easter party, garden party, and I was introducing myself and I said, oh, da-da-da-da-da, and I did this and I did that, and I designed, you know, costumes for Tina Turner, and a voice behind me said, oh, Tina once recorded one of my songs. So I went, what? <laughs> I turned around and um, I said, what, what song was it? He said, oh, you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know. I said, yes, I would. What, what, what CD was it? It was on 24 seven. I said, oh, which one, which one? Oh, it was called Falling. So I turned around and I sang it to him. And um, <laughs> his jaws, in his mouth, his jaws just opened. He's like, oh, okay. And um, what was the name of that guy who, who wrote Falling? His name? Well, he had um, a pseudonym, um, Solomon. It's on the label. His real name is Malcolm. These stories are just wonderful. You yeah. Know? It's so amazing yeah. to hear that. So this... I never really understood it. That mm. particular one, Falling, from the 24-7 album, was so unlike anything Tina had ever sung or recorded, really. It was more like a Sade kind of song or yeah. very yeah. mellow when she was yeah. with that low falling. It was, it was yeah. like really slow and it wasn't up-tempo. It wasn't very Tina. So yeah. it was an, an awkward, a, an unusual choice, I thought. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know why. I know that Terry Britton was involved. Um, I know that Malcolm went to Terry Britton and asked, you know, that, you know, would, would this suit Tina? And he said, yeah, you know, let's give it a go, etc. And obviously it did. Um, and his wife, Joy, he is um, 
I think it's Barbados. It's black English, but um, I think um, his heritage is Barbadian, I believe. And his wife is Jamaican English. Her name is Joy. And Joy is also an artist, paints beautifully. And they were both at the party. So we hit it off. There was Tina and there was also the art and there was also the Caribbean because my family's from Trinidad and, you know, all of that. And so we got on really well and I invited them over to the to the flat where I am now. When I moved to London, I have, as you will discover when you come over and are my guest, um, you know, I, I have I have I have space, I have room. I didn't have this in, in New York. So they were there. Joy and Malcolm come over. They're hearing about my life, how extraordinary my life is. Um, they're looking at the Buddhas as, you know, they say, well, oh, you know, do you practice? I said, no, I don't really. I really don't. She said, oh, because um, your life and everything around you seems to um, suggest that, that you do, you know. And I said, oh, well, not really. I mean, I've always had a spiritual side, but not specifically. And um, and they said, you know, they said, well, we are, you know. I said, oh, that's nice. Okay, you know. And, and they were also practicing the nichering Buddhism, the, yeah. which is what Tina practices. Yeah. And was, yeah. she was introduced to it by somebody named Valerie Bishop, Bishop in 1973. Yeah. yeah. So, so they're there. So the pregnant force, then she said, um, Malcolm and Joy say, well, would you like to come to a meeting? light went off. I thought, oh, yes, absolutely. I went back to 1975. And you see, Tina was the catalyst. Because Tina in 1975, had shown me her Butsudan, which is the little cabinet in which the scroll is hung. We were in the it was a Sheraton Hotel in New York, and I had come with a costume to deliver. And um, we'd done the fitting and she took me sort of into a walk-in closet. You know, she went and she took me into the walk-in closet and she showed it to me. She didn't open it, but she showed me, she said, you know, in this, you know, this is where I come. This is where I pray. This is where I, where I come when I'm happy. This is where I come when I'm sad. And she looked straight at, at me. She said, this is where I come when I'm hurt. Boing. She wanted to know how much I knew. I assumed in my naivete, I thought she just meant, oh, when her feelings are hurt. You know, I didn't know. I didn't know. You know, I didn't. I mean, I knew she was unhappy. I knew she wanted to leave. But I had no idea about the depth of the physical stuff she was going through. But she said, you know, when I when I were hurt. Went right over my head. She got her answer. Oh, he doesn't know. Okay, etc. She left it alone. And thirty-five. But that was that was her planting the seed because I received it. I just didn't act on it. So thirty-five years later, I'm in London. Malcolm and Joy, Buddhism, the song. Um, they're in, you know, do I want to come to a meeting? And that was when, that was sort of my second Chakabuku. And so I've been practicing now for 12 years. Um, there is always a red thread and a link oh. to everything, right? You know, lo the law of attraction or whatever it's called in Buddhism, which is the same, is basically always there and it's oh. always present and it's yeah. always the truth right and mm. when you start uh, working with that and not against it it actually happens just like that yeah yeah but, okay I mean, first of all you started you became a, her costume designer but um that was a little bit later the first time you saw tina was that uh at a live performance? Was that because you were a fan of her or how how did you discover Tina? Oh boy. Um, it goes back to 1961. I was in London, I was at school in London and um, there was a radio station um, that played rock and roll because we only had the BBC and the ITV and it was sort of 
MOR and, you know, really, you know, um, there was a pro one program that did sort of rock and roll called Saturday Club um, on the radio. Then in the early, late 50s, early 60s, there was Radio Luxembourg, which predated um, the pirate stations, Radio Caroline and all of that that came a bit later. Radio Luxembourg was, oh boy, it was wonderful because at 6 p.m., with all the static as you turn the dial, <laughs> you know, all the, you could get, oh, there was blues, there was rock and roll, there was um, R&B, there was, it, it was really lovely. You know, 45s, you know, three minutes here, three minutes there. And a friend of mine had a friend who worked at Radio Luxembourg. And I was given through him a stack of 45s, surplus 45s that they could spare. So I got them. One of them was it's going to work out fine. And on the reverse side was um, Won't You Forgive Me. And he goes, won't you forgive me for what I've done? I it's, thought you said, won't you forgive me? You no, 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 that was the title. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was the title of the song. And um, I, remember, I remember it. That was when I was first aware of Ike and Tina Turner. Um, but then that it was, was so it, early, Christian. I it was mean, this 19, is amazing. How 19, often do you meet anybody who's been who knew about them that early on? 1961. So I was my birthday's in June. So I was either 11 or still 10, depending on when it was released. And um, and I loved it. I was already music was everything all my life. My father played piano. My mother sang all different genres i've just it's in my blood i've been around it all my life and um so i had and i had my portable record player in my bedroom and you know all of that mm. so there was this song and the voice you know it's going to work out fine there was just something about the voice okay so i filed that away but then 1962, 63 was beginning of Phil Spector. And then he went into Motown and I deviated. And, you know, I went, I wasn't into sort of gut bucket, gut bucket you know, R&B. You know, so I, I went into, you know, sort of commercial, more pop. Um, so this goes on. And I knew, you know, I'd seen on television um, when I moved, because when they came to London and did Ready, Steady, Go in 1966 with the Stones and all of that, by that time I had received a scholarship and I was in New York, so I, I missed that. But I caught up with them, or at least, you know, they they came back into my consciousness. Um, late 60s, really. I was in New... in um, I was with the Joffrey Ballet, I had joined the Joffrey Ballet at 16. Uh, New York was now my home. Um, we toured the country, the, um, you know, the, the US, and we were in Los Angeles. It was 1969. And after a performance, you went to a club, I, don't, I forget which club, there weren't discos yet, but it was a club and there were, you know, there was a DJ and songs were being spun and everything. And Bold Soul Sister came on. <laughs> I was on the dance floor. I thought, who is that? You know, because it was <clears throat> so much of what Ike did, you know, he sort of bounced off things that already existed. <clears throat> because um, Bold Soul Sister, if you know the Isley Brothers, it's your thing. It's the same groove, you know, boom, chagun, chagun. Ga -ga 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 -da -ga. It's your thing, you know. Do what you wanna, when you wanna, how you wanna. Now it's it's the same groove, and um, but here was Tina, you know, um, screaming, and I thought, who is that? And there was a production fellow. Um, he's no longer with us at the Joffrey. He said, oh, his name was Jay Stover. 
He said, oh, that's um, that's uh, Tina Turner. I said, oh, really? Oh, because I had a 45, you know, way back when. Oh, you have you ever seen her live? I said, no, I've never seen her live. Oh, you have to see her live because this and this and this and this. And um, next time, next time I hear that she's going to be live, we'll get tickets and I'll take you and we'll, we'll go see. Fine. Lovely. Okay. Boom. Okay. So the next time happened to be 1971 at Carnegie Hall. The, the Carnegie Hall The show. Carnegie Hall. All right. So we... Now that is legendary <laughs> because, of course, they did that double, uh, triple uh, album pack yep. there. And it was actually their most successful yep. album, that Carnegie Hall live Live oh, Carnegie boy. Hall, which was, I think, the 1st of April, 1971, if I'm not mistaken. It was... It was... It was beyond. There were there were a group of us in the Joffrey. Um, there were real movers and shakers. So it was me and three of my cohorts and Jay. And he got tickets and they were way up in the balcony, way up in the balcony at Carnegie Hall. And we got there. The opening act was Fats Domino. And he wore purple sequins and the big pompadour big grand piano and his um uncle the the highlight of his act was he'd be playing boogie woogie and on the downbeat he said on each downbeat he'd bump the grand piano across the stage <laughs> it's like what is going on it was astounding astounding because by that time, the pompadour had sort of come undone, you know, it was hanging in the, you know, the purple sequins and the grand piano, and but everyone went wild. And then we had an interminable interval, because it turned out that um, the reviews plane had, was late getting in. And so the... Um, the interval, the intermission you know, went from half an hour, 45 minutes, you know, everyone was starting to applaud, etc. And then finally, um, they were already the family vibes, I think. So, that, you know, the I think it was Claude, maybe it was the first I th one. I think it was the Kings of Rhythm still. Okay. I think they changed the name in 72 to the okay. family vibes. Okay. So they, they, they began to file on stage and... Um, for the most part, afros, uh, tam o shanters, you know, the big caps, beret sort of style caps. They had um, leather pouches with fringe, leather moccasins up to just below the knee with fringe. They had hot pants and pantyhose. <laughs> I kid you not. That was the look. These big tough guys, you know, out there. And they started tuning up. And um, and then the Iquettes came on, and it was Esther, Edna, Lejeune, Esther, Edna, and Jean, Jean Brown, and they came on. Well, it's on the album. On the album, um, they started with um, "Piece of My Heart," you know, Janis Joplin's "Piece of My Heart," in white minis, halter top with fringe, white fringe, the wigs. And they did that. They did um, Everyday People. They did um, they did Shake a Tail Feather, but that's not on the double album. Um, and then they went off. Then I came on. And then they introduced, um, you know, the hardest working young lady in showbiz of the day, Miss Tina Tanner. <laughs>
Shroom, she comes on. Oh, and Lucas, it was like the heavens opened and I was zapped. It was like, <gasps> what is that? You know, what is that? Because she was like this little golden mosquito. She was way, way, you know, we were high up, you know, and she was just like buzzing all over the stage and the voice. And I couldn't tell where the voice began and the electric guitar. It was it was all elect everything was electric. And um and that was it. I knew this was going to be someone really important in my life. I just knew it. Spotlight is on me, yo. I'd never seen, I'd heard or seen, you know, and the movement. And then the... Had you never seen her on television or had you never seen her perform in one way or the other? Or had you just heard about it? Because in those days, you you only saw what, what was on at that time because people didn't have VCR recorders or video yeah. tapes and this all was, of this that. Was, so was... Yeah, this was the first time I'd seen her live. Had I seen her on television? I don't think I had. I mean, they did appear on Johnny Carson many times. And yeah. On, on also on um, the Ed Sullivan show and Dick Cavett. Well, Dick yeah. Cavett was a bit later, actually. But, yeah, I um, think, no, I think this, I don't think I had seen. I don't think I had seen um, them on television. So it was, it. the impact was outstanding. Um, and then, of course, 1971, Proud Mary had been released, but it was new. And they did three encores of it and brought the house down. And the microphones went flying because, of the, you know, Yadanka, you know, Esther takes the mic out, damn, she puts it out the way, and of course the mic would fall over and they they didn't care. <laughs> it was like everyone, everyone for himself, you know, and they just, <clears throat> they just went at it. And then they, they did it again. And then they did it again. It was glorious. It was absolutely glorious. Just glorious. And her vocal is so strong, so wild on that record. Oh. I mean, oh, it was live, obviously. And, and, because I think it, it, what is so endearing is that, because so many of the dance routines are based on um, contemporary dances of that time you know of you know so i mean it's a swim because you're rolling on the river so what do you do on the river you do the swim <laughs> you know <laughs> and then there's esther on the side which is um that's drowning you know because you're coming up for the third time you're holding your nose and you're going under the water so <laughs> I mean, it was it was you i mean you're laughing you're screaming it was wonderful. Christian, you had been a ballet dancer for at least like 10 years or something. Uh, 71, I joined in 60. Well, I mean, I'd started studying when I was seven. Yeah. So, yeah, in that sense, it was 10 years. So you had been dancing, but that was classical. It was ballet. It was totally different movements from but, China. Yeah. But you were still... Fa what was it like seeing and discovering that world of that rock and roll dancing? Because Tina started the rock and roll dancing. She was a pioneer in that field, huh? I made my debut actually when I was four. And my father had a company here in London called Bosco Holder and his Caribbean dancers. So there was, we did all the dances of the African diaspora, really, whether it be Brazil, Haiti, Martinique, whatever. And I was in the wings, I was learning everything. So there was that. And that was in my blood. And then, um, Formal ballet classes began when I was seven, and then I was smitten. So I knew that that was going to be the, the base of you know what I what I did. Um, but you still had that other side that was. I was always yeah. In I, was, I was and that kind of movement. I was um, what was called a bunhead, which is um, a ballet dancer. Because the ladies, the ballerinas, you know, when you're usually they wear a bun at the back of their heads. So, you know, you it's an endear a term of endearment. So, oh, such a bunhead. It means that that's 
that's sort of what you do all the day. It's just you sew point two ribbons and you know you wear the bun and you know all that sort of stuff. So there was that side of me. But there was also, I mean, I was a wild teenager. I was a mod. Um, you know, I came up during the beginning of Swinging London. There was all of that. You know, I had my Cuban heels and my tab collars and, you know, going, you know, all of that coming up, you know, was, um, and it was ours because the, the 60s before then really sort of belonged to the 50s. And it sort of wove in and out of what our parents had listened to. And then all of a sudden, the music was, was really ours. And that was, that was sort of 1963, 64, with the Beatles and the Stones and the Pretty Things and uh, Manfred Mann and you know, all of the, and Millie, my boy, Lollipop, and you know, all of that coming up. And then when I came to New York, was on a scholarship to the Martha Graham School of Contemporary Dance, which is modern, what we call modern dance. Um, and I was meant to go back after a year, but then Robert Joffrey saw me. He was starting, he was starting up his company again. He had had a different sponsor, um, Rebecca Harkness, and um, that didn't work out. And he was starting a new company again in 65 and I arrived in 66 and my ballet teacher because I also attended high school of performing arts which is what the film fame was about you were trained as a ballet dancer you worked for years and you were that was classical ballet but then you were also interested in rock and roll and you saw Tina and that's a completely different style of dancing but you were moved by that and what did you see when you saw that kind of dancing what did you feel the way Tina did it was just beyond so there were two shows this was the first show then there was a second show and we could have stayed I think Jay stayed for the second show I I couldn't take it I had to leave we went down the side exit Carnegie Hall and we walked to um so it was me my best friend Gary Christ I think Bob Talmadge and there was someone else who was with us at that time and we walked to a club called Tamburlaine which is on the east side as we walk in the door they are playing funkier than a mosquito's tweeted <laughs> so I mean I left Tina and you never heard that. I mean, you never heard, you know, w literally walk in the club, there's Tina singing. I thought, oh, my God, this is really something, you know, this is. Wow. This what is a, this is a sign. We just talked about that <laughs> yeah, sign, that red thread. This that, is a sign. Yes. You know, I was hers. <laughs> you know, this was this is a why, sign. Why couldn't you take staying there for the second show? What was that it about? Was, it was too much. I mean, it was. I mean, the first show had been orgasmic and I couldn't do it again. I mean, it was like, <laughs> have mercy. You know, I couldn't, <laughs> I just couldn't do it again. So I had, I fled into the night, you know. Um, you were done for that night. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so I was smitten. So from then on, I just kept my feelers out for when she was going to be on television. Um, they had all the um, the um, publications <clears throat> that were geared towards, you know, um, African Americans. So there was like Jet magazine, there was Sepia, there was Ebony, and they always ran when they ran articles on Tina. <clears throat> excuse me, something in my throat, they, um, they always included um, her astrological sign, Sagittarius, her height, five foot four, her vital statistics, you know, bust, waist, hips, you know, things like that. And so I would jot those things down. And so I got an idea of who she was, what she looked like, etc. <clears throat> this was 71. So for 72, for most of 73, I'm just watching whenever I can and reading. I had started sewing by that time. Um, 
because I had designed and made a couple of wedding dresses for some of the ballerinas in the company. And it was the early beginnings of disco. And so I had made little tops for myself and things like that, that, you know, because I didn't like what I saw on the racks. I'd sort of, to go to clubs, I'd make things for myself and for a couple of other people. And so I knew I could sew. And did, did you have um, some practice or schooling or was it no, just, just, to... just trial and error, you know, just, um, you know, I had a machine and, you know, it was put on some music and so and oh, you know, things like that. So it was Actually, just the natural was a, talent that you did this. There was somebody that, um, Bernard Johnson, who made fabulous jazz pants in New York. Um, but that's another story. And I used to go to his um, atelier and I'd watch him. So um, so I picked it up, osmosis, you know, et cetera. And of course, I was used to wearing costumes and costumes are designed and you have fittings and I would just absorb. I would absorb what worked, what didn't work, you know, how this was cut, why that looked better, all of that sort of stuff. So um, I made this outfit for Tina, as one does. <laughs> I just thought, well, um, I knew her height and there was some, uh, there was a dancer, Denise Jackson in the company, she was five foot four. And so I made the outfit on Denise and it was the first dress that um, I made. And the reason I came up with that dress was when the album Nutbush City Limits came out, on the cover there is Tina with um, in like an old pinafore with her hair in bunches and she's sort of kicking the side of a jalopy and there's steam coming from under the bonnet and then there are haystacks and outhouses and things on the hills in the background. And I don't know if you know, but in um, America there was a a comic strip called Lil Abner. Lil Abner was um, the brainchild of, of, of a gentleman called Al Cap, and it was about hillbillies. And they lived in the hills. And it was Lil Abner was a young man who was built and self obsessed not terribly bright, but charming and irresistible. And his girlfriend, or at least she wanted to be his girlfriend, was called Daisy May. And Daisy May was always in sort of rags and some, you know, sort of patches and, you know, and then there, and then there was a musical of, of that was made of, um, of, of the comic strip, first on Broadway, and then there was a film. Uh, called Lil Abner, and there was Daisy May and all the other inhabitants of um, Dogpatch was where they lived. So I looked at um, Nutbush and I thought, oh my God, because it's very similar, outhouses and you know, haystacks and things. I thought, oh my gosh, well, what if, what if Nutbush was sort of like Dogpatch? And what if Tina was Daisy May? So then she would be in sort of rags and things with patches, etc. I said, but she's moving and there's the long hair. So there should be something, you know, like strips or rags or something. So I thought, well, what if, what if Daisy May and Tina, there's an elegance to Tina, as wild as she is, there's an innate elegance to her. So I thought, well, what if there is, there was, there is. Um, I thought, well, what if Tina's Daisy May, you know, had these fabulous evening gowns that just got shredded? And so there, so that's how that's how that design came about. She was wearing she was wearing um, designs on the, I think on, um, oh, there was a Harper's Bazaar spread and on the Feel Good album, 
um, they're, but they're more, it's more like lingerie. It's lighter, but it has like a lettuce edge. Yeah, she, she, she is wearing kind of rack, uh, yeah. rack dresses on that feel good. So, yeah, so I, I yeah. saw that, you know, I clocked that, and I thought, oh, I could take it a step further because it's about the hair, and those dresses, they didn't look good when they got wet, you know, um, so they, they weren't made for the stage. And I thought, no, I can, I can, I can do, I can do better than that. You know, I can do that. So that, I, that's how that first dress and the eventual look came about. And, um, okay, so I had Tina's next appearance in New York was at what was then Philharmonic Hall, which is in Lincoln Center. It then became Avery Fisher Hall, and I think it has another name now, but it was Philharmonic Hall. And it was presented by a gentleman whose name was Ellis Hazlip. And Ellis Hazlip had um, a television show on PBS called Soul. Because you had Soul Train, that was different. This was more, this was more beat generation. And so Ellis, I, I sort of knew, and there was a gentleman who worked for him, who I really knew because we used to go out dancing. And I approached him and I said, do you think um, that Ellis could get me backstage to meet Tina when she's, you know, when when they are here at Lincoln Center? And he said, oh, no, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, of course, he knows who you are. Of course, I had a name by then, you know, as, as well known. So he said, OK, no, no, no. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. Well, he set it up. Meanwhile, I had the dress that I'd made on Denise and... Of course, I didn't have a label. Um, the dress was just folded up in a brown paper bag. Um, the idea was that Ellis Hazlip was going to knock on the door. I'd be introduced. I'd fall to my knees. <laughs> I would offer the dress. I would say, I'm not worthy. And she would open the dress and she would see me there and we'd have a conversation. She'd know who I am, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I meet Ellis before the show. He says, hi, Christian. Hi, come, you know, come back. So I follow him back. We have, I have seats in the auditorium, but I follow him back before the show. I don't know if there's a warm-up act. There might have been. So it might have been the interval. I'm not sure. But um, he takes me to the dressing room door and he's about to knock on the door. He gets tapped on the shoulder and... Um, Someone says, oh, uh, Mr. Hayslip, um, there's an emergency. You have to, you need it. You know, you have to go. He went, oh, oh, okay. Um, um, Christian, um, there, there, there's the door. I've got to go. Um, good luck. Okay, so I have this brown paper bag in my hand. And I knock on the door. And the door opens. And I don't know who answered. <clears throat> I don't think, because there was a gentleman called Gerhardt, who was their, their um, manager. It wasn't Gerhard. he. Augustine. Yeah, it wasn't he because I met him later on. But, but I, I, I think that I think Rhonda Graham was still um, the tour manager. She, maybe she was time. around, she was, but there was a man who opened the door. I don't, he might have been, I don't know who he was. But, he but, might, but was he black or white? Because Ger he was white. Was, 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 he was oh, yeah, white. Well, Gerhard was white, obviously, uh, from Germany. Yeah, but I met him and I would have recognized him that yeah. I'd seen him before. This was someone who was very brusque, opened the door like, yeah. And I said, um, well, I have, you know, I have a gift, you know, for, for Miss Turner, you know, that um, I've made and I, may I give it to you? Yeah, well, she can't be disturbed now, kid, because, you know, she's about to get, she's getting ready to go on. She, you know. I said, oh, well, um, um, well, can I give it to you? Can you please see to it that she gets it? So it was either go back with it, you know, mission unaccomplished, or else trust him to get it to her. So he says, uh, yeah, sure, okay, fine. So I said, thank you, thank you. And I'm backing away and the door is swinging shut in my face. Meanwhile, there are um, flashlights going off, people taking photographs and people going back and forward. I, I assumed she was in like a room behind that, you know, but I never got to see her. So I threw it up to the heavens. I said, okay, I've done all I can do. I went and I sat and I watched the show. 
This was um, August 1973. Now, we go on tour of the Midwest in um, the winter. So in January 1974, I go with a group of people to um, a club. We're in Kansas City. And um, we had had, I think we'd had a show in Kansas City. And then we were going to go somewhere else and then come into Manhattan, Kansas. Um, or at least there are two Kansas City. There's a Kansas City, Kansas, and a Kansas City, Missouri. I get confused. But we were in one of the Kansas cities at a club and behind the cigarette machine, which tells you how long ago it was. There was a cigarette machine. And there's a poster. It says, I can Tina Turner, Memorial Hall, Kansas City, Kansas, um, January 27, um, and the time. And I went, oh, my God, you know, this, isn't that a day off? No, no, well, that's, that's a day. It's a travel day. We arrive on that day, and then we have the day off, and then we don't start rehearsal until two days after that. I said, oh, so then we can tell the company manager that we're going to stay in Kansas City, catch the concert, and then join up with the company. Yeah, yeah, okay, so let's do that. <clears throat> so we go, we come back. His name, his name was um, Hans Hortig. It was lovely. And we told him, okay, Hans, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up. We'll catch up with you, but we, we have to stay and see this, this show. So... We go to Memorial Hall. It's this funky little sort of convention center. And there are tickets. And it's the afternoon, so we have, you know, a couple of hours to kill. We come back in time for the concert. Just fold, like folding metal chairs, the sort of place where you'd have wrestling. <laughs> it was like there was nothing romantic or elegant about it whatsoever. And... um we sit, and so this is January 1974. So we sit, and now they are the family vibes. So they come on raid. They open with the theme from Shaft with tight, tight horns, you know, like James Brown horns. Fabulous. Then the eye cats come on, and the girls would rotate, you know, because some of them would get married, some would leave, they couldn't take it anymore. Some would, you know, come, leave and come back. Esther was back, because Esther hadn't been, it was uh, the, the, the ICATS, there was, um, there was an LP called um, Gold and New, and um, where they sang um, some of the old ICATS, it was 1973, I think, they sang some of the old ICATS um, songs. It's a new batch of girls, um, but they sang like Peaches and Cream, and they sang um, the um, the Gong Gong song. I'm blue. I'm blue. Yes. Blue. yes. They sang that, and um, and then they did. They sang the Camel Walk, and then on the other side they sang. Um, whoa, whoa! Listen to the music. Whoa, whoa. They sang, you know, so it was a mix, but it was that group of girls who had been, who had been performing. All of a sudden, Miss Esther comes on and like it's, everyone loved Esther. She's a real old timer. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous performer. Fabulous. So yeah, it's, so, it's so great that you talk about that. I, I also want to go into details about some of those uh, oh. the, the cats there because some of oh. them are very legendary, especially for those Tina <laughs> fans who really know the the backstory and the history and also oh. about the iCats. But but we know that yeah. Esther Jones, which was her name, right, yeah, yeah. was uh, actually the the longest running iCat along with Lei Shun, who yeah. was named uh, Edna. Edna at the time. Yeah. Huh? Because she was married to Socko, the the drummer Edna Socko Richardson, and and I think and 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 Jean. <clears throat> so we were back with Esther, Edna, and Jean, and they come out. 
Yes, that, okay. So I'm trying to keep the dates clear. So they come out and they they do their set. And then Ike comes out and he's in red. And, you know, he starts you know, and then Claude comes and he does his spiel, you know, the you know, hardest working young lady in show business today, you know, et cetera. And Miss Tina Turner, blackout, Pinspot goes over to the side. She steps out of the wing and she's wearing the dress that had been in the brown paper bag six months before. I kid you not. Wasn't that amazing? What are the odds, though, Christian? In Kansas City, I happen to be there on a day off. She happens to think... In the middle of the country, even. And it was by coincidence, just because you were on tour. Yes. And then she's wearing your dress. Yes. And you hadn't even spoken to her. No, I didn't know know if she got it. I didn't know if she got it. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, if she if she did get it, maybe she could use the fabric, maybe she could, you know, I had no idea. Because it had been designed, by that time I knew all the routines. So it had been designed to highlight all the various steps. There's another little coincidence here, and that is that it's now January 2024, and you're talking about January 1974, yeah. so it is exactly... 50 years ago right now that we were doing yes. this show and talking about I, had, it. I hadn't I hadn't I hadn't connected those dots um so I had I had designed the dress apart from the fact that I knew you know her size etc um and the waist was elasticized so there and the fabric gave you know it was it was a knit so it could you know I knew it would it, I knew it would fit <clears throat> But it was that golden one that was where she was like fully covered with long sleeves, even, and it looked yeah, like the back, proper with, with the back here. Wing. And then suddenly the shreds and the rags yeah. and everything. Yeah. And the, it was. And like- you see, this part, this part was cut out on either arm, and that was cut out because in Get Back, um, the second dance break of Get Back, she had this little step. Where she would shuffle back with the with the shoulder, so I cut out this, so I cut, you know, so we could see the shoulder, and then when she turned in higher, I want to take you higher, um, you know, with the shimmy, she turned up stage, and so the back was cut out, so she, you know, she didn't wear a bra or anything, so the back would, and it would all move, and you'd get flashes of skin, and then the the shreds of the fabric moving, and then the hair and all of the, so that's, and there she was doing it wow and i remarkable it was like and it was bat wings you know so what's called dolman sleeves so it came they came down and then all of a sudden there was um in um sweet soul music um there was a step that i hadn't i wasn't familiar with where she yum bam ba da 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 ga 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 da 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 ga Okay. But of course, all of a sudden, with the cut of the sleeve, it was it. <laughs> I mean, I was a chocolate mess. I didn't know what to do. I started crying, and um, so much so that I couldn't go backstage afterwards. Um, my friends tried to sort of scoop me up and get me to go. I couldn't. I could not. I could not. Why not? Though she was she was in the middle of the country in Kansas. I couldn't. I couldn't. You were there I, as your dress. I couldn't. I just, I didn't have, I I couldn't. I was a mess. I was an absolute mess. I had to process it. Let's just pause here for a moment. How did you feel about this? This is more than just a coincidence. It's like a little sign from the universe, obviously. Mm. You had a few of those already. Mm. But mm. I mean, it was like, w- w- what are the odds, though? I mean, it's like, well, 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 how, how can we even say this or underline how... Ex- extraordinary know. that was what did it feel that it all worked what i had envisaged i saw in front of i saw her 
wearing the garment, doing those steps, you know, that, that sort of dictated how the dress would be. Um, so it was almost like you had seen it I inside of your inner, your mind's eye. Oh, when I'm making it, yeah. Because I'd put on, I'd put on records, you know, I'd have her voice would be filling my apartment. I'd be on the floor in my living room sewing, etc. And I'd hold it up and move it around and I'd hold it up to me. And, you know, you know oh, that's nice. And I'd go back and do a little bit more and then I'd, you know, and I'm figuring and then I would take it and then I'd, I'd sort of, Denise, come, can you put this on? Oh, that's, oh, well, maybe if I did, da, 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 da. And that's how it, that's how it came about. Um, and there it was in front of me. So I said, no, what I'm going to do, because I mean, I want to be coherent. I don't want to just dissolve in a, you know, puddle, you know, when I, so I said, what I'll do when I go back to New York, I will, um, I'll write a letter because I had the address, the address for Bolick Sound is always on the back sleeve, you know, the back of the album. So I'll write a letter and I'll enclose a swatch of the fabric so she will know it's um, legit. And I will do that. I'll do it that way. So I did. And um, so I sent the letter off, went on with the tour, Back in New York, we have we had two seasons in New York at that time at City Center Theater. Um, so this we're getting ready for. We're in the midst of the spring season, and um, Jay Stover, bless his heart, um, he was like a production assistant, and so he we're setting we have a quick change. So I'm setting things up, you know, etc. There's a, um, a tech rehearsal. So it's for lights and orchestra. Um, it's a, well, it's a dress rehearsal, really. And we're setting up for the quick change. I have about 10 minutes because they're stopping and starting. And Jay comes and floats by with a big Cheshire cat grin. He goes, Christian, you should always check the call board for your mail. <laughs> I went, oh, okay. So it was this. Oh, can you and hold it up closer, a little bit higher so we can see? Uh, yeah. It says, it's my address, Christian Holder Care of City Center Joffrey Ballet, which is what I had written on my letter to her. And at the top... It's an imprint. It's a print. You know, I can Tina Turner, Bolick Sound, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so I thought, oh my god! So I run upstairs up to the dressing to my dressing room, and I think I can see. I might have to use a torch because then. So this is what the letter says. It's on stationery. It says Tina Turner at the top. And this, so uh, this is what it says. Um, dear Christian, it was a pleasure to, it was a pleasure to hear from you. I've only been trying to reach you for about a year, and to my surprise, I finally get a letter from you. I love the dress, and I've about worn it out, and would love if you could make me as many as your time would allow. Um, the fabric was and still is nice. It moves good. <clears throat> the idea was just fantastic. <clears throat> um, I'd hoped you would be a seamstress, but since you're not, um, I can appreciate it even more. Ike was also very impressed with the dress, and he said he would love to meet you. Um, so, when you're next in LA, here is a number where we can be reached, 678-2632, and leave your name and who you are, and we'll return your call. Um, with thanks. Oh, with thanks again. Um, 
we look forward, we, it's always we, we look forward to meeting you. Love, Tina. Wow, that's extraordinary, isn't it? And it's so, all written. Can you hold it up just a little bit for people to see? It's her hand. Uh, so it's just that the, um, you know, the handwriting isn't always easy to read, which is why I'm stopping and starting, you know. But um, yeah, so this is, you know, this is, so I would have received this maybe March, April, April, um 1974 having seen her in january now it turned out that um lo and behold after the summer tour usually ends the sort of june july we did have some time off so okay and we usually end up in in vancouver something like that you know and we had two weeks off so we rent a car and we drive down the West Coast, Highway 1, down the West Coast of the States of America, which is gorgeous, gorgeous. And of course, it's hippie time, you know, it's 1974, you know, still, you know, still really lovely. Um, and um, and you go from the north, you go from the north, which is sort of craggy and gray, and pines and fir trees and things like that. And, you know, and slowly you hit San Francisco and it changes and then you go further south and then you start to see the flora changes and the, and the you know, the, the, um, the color, the palette changes. And all of a sudden then you're in L.A. with the palm trees and this. <clears throat> so um, to get to Los Angeles, I had... When I get to Los Angeles, I call the number, said, I'm in town. Um, I'm told that, oh, that's great. This was a Friday, um, but Tina's not here. She won't be here till Monday. Um, can you come by on Monday? So I said, yeah, okay, fine. Because so I think that, <clears throat> that there had been a connection before. And I think that the, the meeting was going to be on the Friday. When I contacted the Berlick Sound on the Friday, um, as I know now, it was Rhonda. I didn't know at the time. Um, <clears throat> she wasn't going to be in town till the Monday. So I go, I'm dropped off on the Monday. I go into Berlick Sound. There's a lovely white lady who I now know is, was, was Rhonda sitting behind the desk. And I, she looks up and I said, you know, hi, hello, I'm Christian Holder, you know. Oh, oh, and you're right on time. Well, um, Tina's running a little bit late because she had to go to the grocery store. But why don't you go into the game room, sit down in the game room, and you know, she, I'll tell her that you're here. Fine. So I go and I'm sitting in the game room. And I'm feeling very nervous um, because I had read the Rolling Stone article by... Was it Ben Ben Fong Torres? I think in the Rolling Stone, he'd done a sort of expose about life in Bolick Sound, about Ike and Tina and the Ikeets and how the the how the um, Bolick Sound is equipped, etc. And he had stated that there was CCTV in all the rooms so that I could see, you know, what was going on all over Bolick Sound. So I'm sitting there, sort of feeling like like I'm in a goldfish bowl. There is, I think there was an aquarium, there was a pinball machine, there was stuff, you know, and I'm sitting there and I had made four more dresses. So I'm sitting there. All of a sudden I feel this presence behind me and I leap to my feet and there's Tina in the doorway. Well, and actually I, I, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Um, before that, there's a place in in um, Chicago, in Illinois, just outside Chicago, called Ravinia. This was 1973. So he says, OK, um, come find me. I'll get you backstage. I'll get you to meet Tina. You know, so, so I hadn't met her. So this is before going to Berlick Sound. So I stay with some friends of a friend in the Joffrey, um, who were also Ike and Tina fans. Um, Richard Foley, 
And his partner's name was Eleven. Um, for what is Eleven? Eleven. Eleven. Yeah, one can only imagine. The, what was what, that? His, his... <laughs> <laughs> I, that's, not, that's, not, that's not what I understood. And wow. uh, and they <laughs> and they had a burr constrictor. That was their 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 pet. Oh my so, god! So they said I could. Uh, they said I could come and stay. So I stayed. <clears throat> the the burr constrictor was in a glass. So oh, thank God for that, huh? And they had. Oh God! They had early Icantina stuff that I hadn't heard, 45s. And we would listen and listen and listen and listen and listen. And then we went to see the uh, performance in Ravinia. And it was a strange show because it kept starting and stopping. So I don't know if it was something like I hadn't been paid or whatever, but it, 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 it kept stopping and starting before Tina came out. They were doing a number and then it stopped. They would finish and a number. They would finish. One? Yeah, they would finish a number and then the band would go off stage, or I could go off stage, and then they'd come back on stage. So because, you know, usually there was either trouble backstage, or he didn't get enough cash, or you know whatever, you know. So it was, it was like really stop and start. It was strange. But he was a notorious, obviously, a, a, a control freak, and also yeah. about about the money and being paid mm -hmm. in advance mm -hmm. or half time, mm -hmm. or I mean that we know obviously mm -hmm. that that it, but I mean even in front of an audience, that's kind of it was it was it's a slightly unprofessional, isn't it, or or what? Yeah, how would yeah. You, how would it, you... it was it was strange. It was weird. Once Tina came on, it went all the way through. Um, I think it was like between the band. It didn't segue, you know, it was between the band and the iCats and then the iCats and then there was a pause and then they came back on. It was like really strange. But the iCats came on, I forget. I think it was still Esther. Well, Esther was I, there it, for I most of the time. I, yeah, I don't think it was Jean. I, I forget who the other two were, but um, and they came on. <clears throat> There is on YouTube, um, it's a midnight special clip that's um, that's um, introduced by Helen Reddy. And the girls and Tina come on singing, um, can't turn you loose. If I do, I'm going to lose my mind. Right, when she's wearing a red dress. <laughs> and they're and in huge platform shoes. huh? Yeah. And they are in sort of yellow pantsuits. Yes. So this time in 1973, I think that was an iCat called y Yolanda. Oh, Yolanda Goodwin. She was fab. She was fabulous. Yolanda was lovely, 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 lovely. Um, but the three iCats that came on, they had those suits, except they were in shocking pink, and um, and they came on with. Um, remember Joe Tex? I gotcha. Yes, of course. And I love their version because they did release it on one of their live albums. Yeah, I gotcha. So they, so they, they started with that, and um, it was always everyday people, and I forget what else. Um, and then Tina came. It was nice. So at the end of the show, I go backstage. Of course, I'm at home because we had performed there, and George is there. How and interesting so, that I'm, your tour with the ballet was often following Ike and Tina's tour. Yeah, I mean, there yeah. were some quite remarkable coincidences there. Yeah. So, so they knew me, and George was there. He escorted me back and um, knocked on the door, said, uh, you know, Tina, there's, uh, there's someone who'd like to say, oh, yeah, sure. So I come in. It was the first time I'm actually seeing her in the flesh. Um, and I'm thinking already... Um, the size and taking a photograph. She'd taken off the long wig, it was a short wig, um, with a top that she's actually wearing on one of the covers of, I think it's Jet magazine, short little cap sleeves, a short wig, a short one. With, and I remember because it was just one little hairpin. She, she just like one little hairpin over the top. And she, and, you know, and she still had on some makeup. And she went, hi, hi, how are you? I said, hello, Tina. And she said, oh, you're an opera singer, huh? So I said, no, I'm not a musician. Oh, because the accent. So I said, oh, no, well, no, I'm not, you know, etc. So we had some pleasantries. 
and I left. That story you had not told before, have you? No. So you hadn't met her before, but Just you didn't like talk that. about costumes at that time. No. This might have been 72. Before you made that dress and before you decided I made the dress. that you wanted before. to give it a try. and I had forgotten that. So, you know. And did you also meet Ike there at that no, time? I didn't, meet him time. I didn't meet him that time. I hadn't met him yet. So Tina was alone in that dressing room? Tina was alone. And then um, I said, good night, etc. Ike and Tina were staying at the Sheraton. Now, Ike had handed out little cards inviting certain people to the party room. <laughs> well, probably women, I would I would assume. But he and I got a card. <clears throat> really? Because Did I think know? because I think they were all also looking for drugs and you know scoring and all that sort of stuff. So we we got a card. Uh, one of the musicians was saying, hey, hey dude, you know so fine. So I have the card. So it says Sheraton Hotel, you know, the room number, etc. So we drive to the Sheraton. So we go into the lift, into the elevator. And who's in the elevator but Tina and Rhonda? And they have little paper bags like takeaway. Really? And she by this time, she has just not interested. You know, she, oh, hi, not interested. And I'm there. So we go up to the floor and she goes, she and Rhonda go this way and we go this way and we're looking for the room. And then I hear Tina say, oh, Rhonda, we didn't go the wrong way. And they come back and then there's their room. And as they're going into the room, I say, oh, excuse me. Um, you know, I've got a card for the party room. Do you have to know where it is? Ike parties, I don't, slam. Tina and Rhonda's walking back and yeah. you're asking them both, where is the party room? Party room, yeah. And, so, then, and then she says, like, really? in a I parties, I don't. Boom, close the door. I said, oh, okay. Okay, but we found the party room. We stayed for maybe 10 minutes because it was tacky. It was mostly the musicians, some hangers on, some girls that the musicians had picked up, and some people they were hoping to score coke or something like that you know so but tina wasn't i mean i how would i know tina wasn't there i didn't see any eye cats so we left so that was that little episode did you feel already by the um well how tina acted and reacted that that something was not totally right that she wasn't happy that that he was doing something that was you know that was a little yeah. bit repulsive to her no, well, I felt that she would have been tired. She performed. You know, the makeup had come off. People are different off stage sometimes. You know, um, when I saw her in the dressing room, she was still on a little bit. Now, you know, the curtain had come down. She wanted just to be left, you know, it wasn't, I, I didn't, I didn't make that much out of it. I was just surprised because it was very abrupt. You know, um, now I understand, you know, but at that time. <clears throat> so, because um, I didn't know if she, did, you know, I was, I thought maybe she parted. I didn't know, you know. Um, so now after, after Memorial Hall and she's in the dress and I've gone down the West Coast and she's in the doorway at Burlick Sound. So I jumped to my feet. I said, Tina. She said, oh. So I'm trying to remember because I think I had said, oh, we met once in Ravinia. She said, I'm trying to remember. But anyway, here you are now. So she's holding a, she's holding a, a grocery bag. And it's a wig with a side part. And a sort of chocolate brown mini dress with short sleeves, buttons down here, um, hose like smoky colored hose and, and pumps. And what did smile. she look like? I mean, that close up at that time and th th this was a different era from the from the Tina, Fabulous. very glamorized. I mean, in, in that way, she was more like picking up the groceries at that time. She was a but housewife when she was at home. But, in, still uh, it, but still it was Tina and she had on the hair and everything. 
it wasn't like um you know the cover of um nuff said where she has on the cap and no wig you know it was it wasn't that she was done she was done and um casual but done so i follow her out and she says Rhonda, dial me through would you i'm going to take christian up to the to the apartment so what happened in the behind the desk there was you had to dial something so that the walls behind the desk would open and you'd step through and there's so it's like going into an, like going into a pyramid or something where the, you move the sand the sand comes in and everything closes closes um so we move in and she's there are the the um the studios she said now these are the studios now everything you've ever heard on me has been recorded right here and she said okay so um let's go up to the um let's go up to the apartment because i have to um i have to fix um ike his his dinner you know he said she said because um well you know he's been up for like five days straight you know how musicians are um, so we go up and it's this um well you must have seen photographs of it it's very gaudy um there's sort of stenciled flowers going up the walls um on paper and then there was this um there was a mural of a black couple sort of naked in an embrace with like a waterfall and it's like really strange, really strange. It's like olive greens and turquoise, and it's like well, they were having sex on that huge wall. They were, yeah, they were, just, yeah. But I mean, yeah. it was kind of uh, well, Rhonda. I I interviewed Rhonda as well, you know. And, yeah, and she said it was I saw Irish that yeah. or yeah, it was uh, vulgar. I mean, I mean that that really it was. was his, his taste. It was. It? it looked like a bordello. I mean, it looked. It was like really cheesy it was really cheesy um and then there was the dining table long with chairs that elongated backs around and then there was a door that went into the bedroom and then there was sort of like the living room area which had a which had a, a coffee table with um like a sofa that had like tentacles that came around. <clears throat> it was really bizarre. I, I find that in my writing, I like to, I, I want to be really like with the hip thing because everybody's like a sort of hip bag. Yeah. But I find that a lot of it I'm not able to use. Like one song I wrote, K got laid, Joe got paid. <laughs> but, but you know, a long time ago, laid was when you got drunk, you know? So then uh, it's really a groovy song. And Ike says, well, the only thing he could do was like go to the, was the FCC and, and get the definition of laid and so forth. But, but then he says, to keep that, well, he's going to fight it. Because like, it's really a clean song, really like, just like a typical prostitute today, really like, you yeah. know. But it's a clean song, really nice groove and everything. But I find myself writing that way, and, I, and I, it's, it must be the other me or something, you know, because I don't know. But the, it's just really weird. That, that next album coming out, I wrote all the tunes. Every one of them? Every one, every, all yes. the tunes since Nuff said, I wrote them all about, about everything. So I had my bags. I said, you know, um, Tina, I made you some. Oh, that's great. Well, let me let me get let me let me let me see the dinner. And then, you know, so I, she sat me down at the table and she starts to prepare dinner. And she's speaking a mile a minute. And then she's asking me questions and she'd look around and I'm like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Wow. You know, so she's she, like talking and talking yeah. while she's doing the dinner and yeah, she's cooking I, and she's yeah. cooking in the studio, not at home, in their home. And it's in the, it's upstairs in Bolick Sound. Yeah. And had you met Ike at that point? No, no. He's, he's sequestered in the, in the bedroom. So she's looking, you know, and then, it registered and then she just goes on and on. And Lucas, she is, she's reaching up to cupboards to take things down and the wig is swinging and the mini skirt is rising up and she's talking a mile a minute. And then all of a sudden she's in the, in the refrigerator 
and she's stooping down to the crisper at the bottom of the refrigerator to get lettuce and stuff like and the hair's falling over and she's flicking the hair back and there's like, I'm just like <laughs> oh my goodness oh my goodness and she's completely oblivious she's just doing what she always does you know and and the, and there were you with your idol in that way i mean you had been see it was it must have been so surreal it that was. she was acting this homie with, with you in that it was way wonderful. Right? and she was preparing chicken and dumplings that's what we had for dinner she gave me a plate um she took she took she took a tray in for ike and then came back and then we ate and she said oh and that's hot water cornbread if you don't know what that is and she, you know, I said, oh, Tina, this is delicious. Went, is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what Was it delicious? Was it, it was fabulous. Fabulous. So once we finished eating, she said, okay, now let's see what you have for me. Said, okay. So I'd had three dresses. One was, well, the first one was a green version of the first dress. But I don't think she ever wore that. The fabric was quite, was different and it was a little too lightweight and see-through and it didn't really work. I saw that immediately, but she loved it. <laughs> but I don't think she ever wore it. Um, then there were the two bronze numbers, the two-piece, which there's a lot of, that's been captured quite a lot in photographs. With It had like bronze tassel. It was a, the front. That was the one that, because I knew about Sheena of the Jungle, I had read about that and I thought, oh, okay, so I'll go there. So it wasn't rags, but it was just this triangular peak in the front and at the back with a tassel and a bra that tied around in front. She loved it. Um, and then there was, before that was another bronze one, Lurex one, that just had a halter top. So she put that on. She took off her, she took off her, her dress so she was in pantyhose and panties and her shoes and she had on a bra. And so she put on the one with the halter and she parted the hair and she said, you know, can you do me up? So I mean, I had to, I'm, you know, I'm touching the wig, I'm touching Tina. I'm trying to get the, I'm trying to get the hooks into the eyes. You know, I mean, my hands are shaking. It's like, oh my God, she's completely oblivious. So this one works. And uh, apparently there's a, um, the mirror is in the bedroom. So she says, oh, this is up right back. So she goes in, tiptoes in to the bedroom, closes the door. So she's in there for like a minute or so, and then she comes out. Oh, this is great, Kristen. Look, you know, and the, and the way it moves and look how it's, oh, and she said, but I mean, I have fittings for things and, you know, they, they, they don't fit like this. This is like, well, you're the family. So, oh, what's the next one? So the next one was Sheena of the Jungle. So, um, and the dresses all had names of the various songs. So Sheena of the Jungle, I believe, was Popcorn, which was in, wasn't that in Let Me, Let Me In Your... Um, let me touch your mind. Let me touch your mind. And popcorn with a whole lot of butter on it. That Speak song. That song was on. on let me touch your mind. That album. Yes. So I think. So I think that was what I called that dress. And, um, and so she wrote that song. Actually, she wrote a lot of. A lot of and people. I, don't I didn't. Know how I didn't even understand. I didn't even know that at the time. You know. Um. So it had a, it had a bra. So she started putting it on. She said, "Oh no no no!" She just took off her bra. And so she's just there in her panties and her pantyhose and her shoes, and then she puts on the bra, my bra, and you know she ties it and she, she I'll be right back. She goes and in. And she was practically naked in front of you just that, yes. at that first meeting. Yes. And she she goes into the bedroom again. She's in there. I have enough time to cool off. She comes back out, oh, it's great. And she does a turn and it wraps around her leg and she kicks it in and unfurls and she she loves it. She said, okay, next. The next one was the red, the red dress with the uh, one sleeve. And that one was called Sweet Rhode Island Red, which was one of, you know, so. Yes. So she, she, was, she was thrilled. She puts this on. 
she inflates. She goes back in the bedroom. So so Ike is in the bedroom. Ike's in the bedroom. She's showing Ike. And there's a mirror. There's There's a mirror. mirror. Yeah. So then she comes out. When she comes out, there's a little girl with her. And the little girl is playing with the strips of fabric and running between her legs. And it's Mia. Who, she who, says this. Mia is, of course, Anne Ike's Thomas's daughter with, with Anne Thomas. Yeah. Was his so I just see this. I just see this adorable little girl, and she's playing. She's, oh, you like this one, darling? You know, she's running. She's like doing like a maypole with the. You know, she was. She might have been maybe seven. You know, so she's a little little girl. I think she's from. Is she from um, in sixty eight or sixty nine? Okay, so this was seventy four. Yeah. She would be six. She'd be six or seven. 68, 69. Would, she would have been at that time, would, wouldn't she? Yeah. Yeah. And did you she, also see Anne Thomas? She, yes, she must have been there. <clears throat> she was, but I haven't seen her yet. Maybe she was in the bedroom. She was. <laughs> wow. Uh, so there's Mia. And Tina loves the dress. She loves the dress. So then she takes it off. She puts back on her garment, her her, her mini. Um, she goes back in, <clears throat> comes back out. She says, well, Christian, um, I would really like to meet you. He thinks this is very special. So I said, oh, OK, OK. So she opens the door. And I go into the bedroom. Oh, wow. Drum and, roll. Yeah. <laughs> Do go on. Spill the beans. So <clears throat> on the bed is Ike with his eyes rolled up in the back of his head like this. And behind him, the headboard is mirrored. So as I'm approaching him, I can see my reflection in the mirror. And I can see behind me, there's Tina who's standing in the doorway like this. And I, I just felt it, you know, I did, it was like, okay, you know, but then I, it was Ike, you know, so, but I felt there was tension behind me. Now next to Ike, standing at the side of the bed is Miss Thomas, full negligee, wig, makeup, done, and she's, you know, she's there helping him receive his lady-in-waiting sort of thing, you know. Um, so I'm approaching, and Anne helps him sort of sit up and fluffs up a, a pillow. And I said, you know, and I'd made, I'd made some chaps for Ike, you know, the cowboy chaps. Um, oh. I didn't... I, I don't know if he ever wore them, but I felt that I should include him. And Tina was thrilled. She she literally went, "Oh, oh, well, that's oh, that's nice," you know, because I I had thought to include him. So I had the I had this to offer, and um, and then he starts in this Mississippi draw, and I'm I have to read his lips because I don't know, you know, it's a Oh, 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 like oh, so so you 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 the dude. So you you you're the dude who made the dress with the, you know the rag dresses. You know, goes, that, that's out of sight, man. I, you wonder who's this cat? Who's it? <laughs> I'm trying to read his lips to see what he's saying. You know, and Anne is there, just poised, and um, but we had. He was very gracious. He was lovely. He was lovely. So it was and, actually a good experience for you to meet was, like the person, even was. though he was out of his mind on code yeah. or whatever. And, and he um, and Tina then came in, and she sat. Was I? I guess I sat on the bed, and there was like a little stool or a little end sort of stool thing there, and she was sort of up and and she started like massaging his feet and doing things like that, and and. Um, and he said, "Oh, play, play, play the play the new record, play the new record for 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 Christian." You know, I want to hear what you. So, and the new record was "Sexy Ida," 
And um, he said, yeah, I like this. You know, it's it's like, uh, it's like slice, thank you. You know, thank you for let me be myself, which is the same. He did it off that groove. Don't give your love to sexy Ida. Thank you for let me be myself again. I mean, it was the same. He, he that's that it was built on that. How interesting with that connection, huh? And they did yep, two so, versions of they did two versions of sexy Ida, part one and part two. Well, that two. was it because he didn't know which one to choose. So and this was before that they were released. It hadn't been released. Ah. It hadn't been released. He just had the master or whatever. He just he just it was it hadn't been released. He was going to. He, in fact, he had a conversation with somebody at the record company, and while well, in my presence, because he didn't know which side to choose, and um, he played both for me. He says, oh, "Which one?" And I said, "Oh my goodness!" He said, "Well, actually, I like both of them." He said, "Yeah, we can't decide." He said, "Well." Why don't you do like a part one, part two? Bling! He goes. Yeah, I, 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 th I thought of that. So it was you. All along, you and were so the one suggesting that. Says, yes, he says, and, and, call so and so and so and so and so. And then he has this conversation. Hey, no, we got this, you know, you have good, great idea. You know, I played for a friend, and he's, he's, he's part one, part two. He's, 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 you know, so when he goes to number one, Tina goes, "Oh, number one," <laughs> she's massaging. You know, oh, oh. so all of that happened, and then um, I said thank you, and he said, "Yeah, great, great, beautiful work." You know, great, and so Tina says, um, "I'm going to take, I'm going to take Christian off over to the, um, I'm going to take Christian over to the house." Okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay, okay. So I go out with Tina, and then Anne, Anne comes back out, and says, "Tina, Tina, come back." You know, so she goes back in. She comes back out with the check. That had been the furthest, furthest thing from my mind. That's not why I did it. That's not why I even did the first check, the first dress. It wasn't like, oh, I want to make dresses for Tina. I'm going to, you know, this is what I'm, it was a gift. It was, this is what I had to do. It's my offering. These were my offerings and I'm being given a check. And initially I said, oh, Bettina, she, and you, no, 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 this is business. This is good. You know, we, you know, I, you know, I'd want you to do, you know, I need like maybe nine dresses a year. I mean, if you can do that, man, you know, yeah, sure. Okay, fine. So I take the check. Well, you even sounded like her a little bit there. <laughs> so, so I kind of know it's her. Huh? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is an extraordinary scenario. Isn't you're, it? You, you're explaining and and telling telling us here. I mean, this is like not even getting just an 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 inside view. You were on the bed, and there there was the mistress, famously Anne Thomas, obviously, and Ike out of his mind. Tina cooking, standing there w without her bra, and yeah, and look. I mean, this is that's very fast that you're getting that treatment. I mean, I don't think a lot of people got that on the first day i mean and was it your demeanor or your presence your personality the fact that you were not a threat or you I were young so. and, and you were you know you know a different and i think she was aware of how bizarre i mean how wonderful it was you know how things were just meshing you know um completely at ease um and Ike was nice to me, you know, he was nice. Anne was nice, little Mia, you know, running around. It was lovely. So she takes me to over to the house. We get into her Jaguar. Now I'm six foot four. So to get into a tiny little Jaguar, my knees are up against my chin. The but Jaguar we, that Sammy Davis Jr. gave her. I, Tina, one Tina, that one, yep. And so we go in and it's the the house is not even five minutes away. View Park, yeah, up on that uh, hill, uh, yeah, Olympia, Olympia Drive, and um, so we go in through the garage. So you know the door opens, we drive in into the garage, and we the, we go into the house through that back door. Um, on there's like a sink. At the, on the by the sink are three headstands with wigs on them. 
And I don't know, I don't know if they're being conditioned. It wouldn't have been, they weren't being colored because they were there for a long time. So either they'd been washed or I don't know, but they, some, they were being, they were waiting to be tended to. They were wet and they were waiting to be tended to. And so we go in, we go in through the door, we're in the house. As we go inside the house, her four sons, like like deer, in you know, like. And she says, "Oh no, this um, hi, this is my new friend. This is my designer. This is this is Christian." And da, da, da. Oh, oh, Whew, and they, you could just you could just see they didn't know what to expect. You know, what usually happens when someone comes into the house. You know, is it Ike? Is it you know what they were on guard? So they were on guard because they never knew they what never kind knew. of a mood Ike they was never in. Knew. They never knew. And so Tina set me at ease. She said, let me show you around the house first. She shows me around the house. And um, she said, you know, oh, and this is Onyx smelling up the place. That was the big Great Dane. Um, sweet, sweet, you know, big. And, you know, she said, it was dark by that time, but she showed me where the pool was and et cetera, et cetera. And she takes me into the master bedroom. And um, she said, oh, damn it, I forgot the dresses. So she so said, oh. <clears throat> but anyway, have a look at these. So she opens the, 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 the closet. She said, um, you know, these, these are the, you know, you know. And here's your dress. This is the first one. Here's mother. She called it mother. Here's mother. And she said, but it got a little run, so I, you know, I can get away with it, but it's not like, it's not the way I like to perform, you know, as I said, you know, but, and she said, I even tried to copy it, and, you know, but it didn't turn out the same way. I mean, you can never copy an original. So, I mean, it just, blah, 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 blah. And she said, and there's this one, I got this in Paris, but I have to like cut it up or rip it up or something, you know, and this and that and the other. Then she just gets down on her knees and she starts throwing things over her shoulder. Um, she says, you know, look at the, this is for, this is for the brown one, for the brown, you know, pumps, boom. She said, oh, and look at this, um, ankle straps and a little bit of a platform. And they're sort of, um, with go uh, with, um, they were red sure. with, um, sort of, um, flitter, flitter, glitter on them, you know, beautiful, like a three inch heel, four inch heel with a, with a little bit of a platform. Look at this, the exact same shade of red. Exact, you know, boom. She said, she said "Oh, um, why don't you take? Why don't you take this? It's one of Ike's green jumpsuits. I have it here. Um, you have it there. I have it with me in the, in the cupboard. Yeah, really. Yeah, I do. Oh, we'd like to see that. I have. I have. Yeah, yeah. Um, I um, there was another little dress that she's not. Oh, she showed me." The zebra skin one that had the feather tail and that you, you know, she showed me that one. That one, she said, you know, I wear this with a fishnet skin, et cetera, et cetera. This uh, zebra dress, which was like a, uh, like a zebra. Yeah. The tail. Was that <clears> one? <throat> that one. And that one, we of course know because that was on some, uh, yeah. well, uh, the, the, the cover of one of their albums. Yeah. Revelations. So she she showed me that one. Um, <clears throat> I think Ike had something to do with the design of that. I think she said. Um, and then there was another one that had like chain, like silver, metallic chainmail, sort of here, and then it went into white, white below. So she said, maybe you can do something with this. So she was just throwing stuff. And um, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Completely at home, no formalities. She was like a little girl. Um, the day had gone well. She said, oh, I love it when things, when things work out like this, you know. I said, well, you know, I had, to, I had to call a taxi because I was given a lift to get there. That was that, it was actually a long day with her, wasn't it? It was a long day. It was dark now. I had to call a taxi to get back to where I was staying. 
She called a taxi for me. It was going to take about 20 minutes to get there. She takes me back into the garage, puts on yellow gloves. She starts tending to the wigs. She gives me a little um, scrapbook. She says, oh, have a look at this. She puts on her, her gloves and she rinses the wigs. <clears throat> She's there. Well, at that time, she seemed quite open about the wigs. It wasn't like a secret. Oh, like no, no, no. Like later on, it was more kept, you know, when she became the yeah. Tina Turner, the big yeah. solo queen of rock. And they could have been for the Iquettes, you know. I mean, who, you know, I, there were three of them. You know, I, who knows? I don't and, know. And did she also make the Iquettes w wigs? Do you know that? That I don't know. But they were very full. I mean, they weren't things, you know, like Edna's was full, you know, so I'm sure she had, there was work done to them, obviously. Um, so I'm waiting for the taxi. She sees to the wigs. She still has on the yellow gloves. Um, it just becomes really, really mellow. And she says, oh, you know, I love it. I love it when things work out like this. This is, you know, what's your sign? I said, I'm Gemini. Oh, oh my moon's in Gemini. We're going to get along just great. I said, oh, okay, fine. She said, you know, well, you know, Chris, I'm going to call you Chris. Is that okay? <laughs> Whatever, you know, you know. She said, I'm going to call you Chris. You know, this is really special because um, when I got that dress, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know who it was from. I didn't, you know, I thought, what am I going to do with this? It's all ripped and it's, you know, she said, oh, but when I put it on, it was, it was raw, but it was, it was elegant, you know, it was just, it was me. And I just thought, wow. And so, you know, I've been chanting, you know, Buddhist chants. So I've been chanting for whoever made that dress to come into my life. And here you are. Wow, that's amazing, huh? That's such an such a great story. Wonderful story. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. Just mellow and chill. Just beautiful. And also, she wasn't really allowed to see a lot of people and a lot no. have a lot of friends, even no. girlfriends. She was mostly with and thomas or rhonda obviously or those people uh, apparently and certainly not male friends but of course everybody knew that you were not a threat yeah 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 it and was... also how old were you at this time you were you must have been like in your 20s or something 20s. well 1949 this was 1974. i'm not good at math so i was 20 five or six Something like that, yeah. 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 And then she said, you know, she said, you know, I really believe whatever you want in life, whether it's long, fing if it's fingernails or it's long hair or record contract or if it's, you know, whatever, you, you have to think it, be it, cut things out, put it in a book. You know, you have to really concentrate on it, project, visualize it, and it'll happen. It'll happen. And then the taxi drove up. And I said, okay, so I'll I'll just get to work. I'll do as many. That'd be great, Chris. You know, thank you, thank you, thank you. And got in the taxi, and she was silhouetted in the doorway, you know, sort of like this. Got in the taxi. <laughs> tried to try to, you know, figure it all out. What just happened? Beautiful. And then it began like that. And so then other dresses came. I was inspired by different songs and different look, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There were um, this um, this one. I have all these letters. Back back in the day when people still wrote letters to each other, right? Yeah. It means so much. You know, it's just so, so wonderful. Yeah. And, and you could feel that she was emanating a certain kind of energy, like soul wise was what was that like compared it was very, to the to the stage persona and how she maternal. was on the stage it was very maternal very maternal and soft no messing around you know 
Oh, be- beautiful, beautiful. Um, and how did you communicate with Tina when she was like talking and doing all of that and throwing things around and being fun? And, and I got, you know, I was able, I was, <clears throat> I was able to, I was able to not make a complete fool of myself. You know, we had a con, we had conversations, you know, etc. She wanted to know what I did, um, you know, how my life was, etc. And um, she was really interested. And she was very open-minded, wasn't she, about lifestyle and about how people did different things and, and everything? What, what was She was, it was as if I were one of her children, you know, as one of the boys, you know, it was, it, it was maternal. And there's strictness in being maternal too, you know, but, um, oh, she was lovely, lovely, lovely. And so then I just got on a roll. And I would start to do, I forget. So after that came, I think maybe the purple one came next. Um, the purple, and then there was a black one, and then the and the it would just be inspired. I was just left to my own devices. On the front side of the Acid Queen album, she's wearing red sequins. It has her usual peak in the front and peak in the back. But if you really look at it, the top is the shape of my first dress. So she copied that dress in red sequins and then put her own bottom on it. And then on the back is, um, she's doing, it's going to work out fine. Um, with the, with the red. And that is, um, so that's, that's one, that's the dress that Mia loved was wrapping herself up in. <clears throat> And that was taken, that photograph was taken New Year's Eve at uh, the Fillmore East because I attended um, both shows. The first show, she wore the two-piece, the Sheena popcorn. And then for the second show, she came out in the red dress, um, New Year's Eve. Gorgeous, fabulous. And I went with a photographer, a professional photographer, was a buddy of mine. His name was Randy Green, and he just happened to have his his camera with him, and he took all the so the back photograph. They were thinking, should that photo? Because I think it's actually a nicer photograph. The one on the back should have been on the cover, um, but then the record company, or whatever, reversed it because that dress she wears in Tommy in the film Tommy. And so it was politically more astute to put that in the front, you know, for as a, as a brand. Yes. <laughs> I think actually it ended up on some some cassette tapes, yes. which we also had at the time. Uh, the, the cassette version of Acid Queen was that picture actually with your dress. Oh yeah, it's it's so much. That I'm, I'm really proud of that dress. It was, and it just, materialize i mean one sleeve you know it's um the rags uh okay so i was inspired by the fabric i went to get the fabric and i saw the fabric and it spoke to me and that's how that um you know that's how that and did tina ever tell you what kind of costumes she wanted you to make for her or did you just have uh you know you i just, just had free shoot... reign i just had free reign um <clears throat> She wanted the one in white. She said, oh, you have to do something in white for me. That, that was that. And I had made- And we do have pictures of that one in, in white as well. You sent me some yes. of those and I have some already, right? Yes. Which is also quite a famous dress, obviously. Yes. yes. Yeah. So that one, the color, you know, she asked specifically for that. And you also did a black one that was also a rag dress, the same type that you wore on the share show with uh, yeah. yeah. With the hearts. That was and that was because she always wore a heart pendant, a diamond. I guess I would have given it to her. So I just clocked, you know, I just thought, ooh. You know, so there was there was, you know, there was a reason. It came it, it was organic. It came it came from somewhere. It came from her. And, and did she ever do fittings with you or did you just know her measurements by heart or? I just sort of knew, no, there were never fittings. Um, not until Roger, when, when, when Roger came, Roger was, was lovely. I loved Roger. He was really, really nice. 
when you're he, talking about Roger Davis, Davis, which became Tina's manager, it just, yes. it's just for the audience in case they don't know yet. Yes, and yes. that, that well, she eventually yeah, yeah. met Roger in 1980. Yeah, and so then just, and then yeah. he um, planned and arranged everything that eventually you know became yeah. her comeback. But uh, so, we can go into that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, how it's how it began to change over was when she left Ike. Um, she won, which is, there's another story. But, yeah, but did you ever see anything happen between them? I mean, anything bad? Or did you ever see Ike not behaving in a good way? Or were you afraid of Ike? Was he nice and yeah. accommodating to you? How was it? You knew that you didn't want to miss. I mean, you just knew not, you know, don't miss, don't miss with him. You know, sort of like, sort of reptilian. You know, like a crocodile or an alligator, and you just see the top of it and you see the eyes. It's it's like just don't don't mess. But he was really nice to me. Um, before that New Year's Eve concert, I heard from Rhonda they were going to have. Um, there was a reception at the Essex House, which is on Central Park South in Manhattan. And I was invited and I had an outfit for her, which would have been this, my first outfit after all of, after the four dresses. And um, Rhonda invited me. So Tina came in looking fab. Um, and then Ike came in, I saw Ike, they came in together. I circulated, I said hello to Ike, etc. Tina finally found a moment where she could come to me. I gave her the 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 um <clears throat> the 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 bag that the dress was in. She started to open it. And she closed it and she said, I'll save it, I'll save it for a quiet time. Because it was different, it was on a different I wasn't necessarily thinking of doing every dress the sort of same. It was it had one leg. Because I like the one side. It had one leg. It had um, a cinched belt that had a big heart on it, and it had um, a black bra that was tie tie around, and it was made of sort of faux leather, stretch leather. And it had also one one leg and like a little, just from here to there, um, sort of a sleeve that wasn't attached. And um, she never wore that. But that actually, I don't, I don't know if I, if I should fit it in now. Well, do, we are quite excited now. Okay. Jumping forward a bit. New Year's Eve, fine. The next time she was in New York was at a club called Barney Google's. That's where I met Gerhard. Um, <clears throat> small little, it was a bar with a performing area in the back. <clears throat> Yolanda was with them by then. Um, she wore, Tina wore um, a dress that was that had the same top as the, as the first one, except this was sort of in gun metal. And, um, and it didn't have the rags. It was more like the sequin dress that was on the Tommy. Um, on the Acid Queen. I sort of did that, but in my fabric, et cetera, et cetera. She wore that. It was really nice. Um, didn't go to the dressing room. God knows what in a place like that. You know, obviously I wasn't surprised. There was no invitation to go to the dressing room. Um, Esther <laughs> didn't get back. Because uh -huh. because they go, but uh, go, you know the, the girls go with the karate chops, etc. And Esther went up to Ike or something, and he'd swatted her or something like. Next thing I know, she went off stage. <laughs> I guess dislodged the wig or something like that. So Ike, so Ike hit Esther, and well, I mean, there was a, there was always in, there was always interplay, you know. But I'm gonna get you know, and I guess it was too close. Next thing, Esther was off stage, then oh. she comes back on. She comes back on, da -da, and Tina goes, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> get on with the review. 
Um, because the wig I, was not on straight. I think she just had to, you know. But didn't they usually, I mean, they, they always pinned it down. They did, but there was some reason, something happened and she had to go off stage. I don't know what he did. I don't know what he did, but she had to go off stage. She finished the show. It was great. And then afterwards, um, I just sort of waited. It was like staircase and down in the basement. So I waited and then Gerhard came up and I said, oh, he said, oh, you're Kristen. Yeah. He said, well, um, yeah, well, it's not good to go down to the dressing room, but Tina's going to, cause the car's going to come and pick her up. And, you know, so, you know, when she, she'll pass by, but um, no, but say hello. Say, you know, she respects you. She respects you. Say hello and come in. Fine. So she came by, I was waiting on the pavement, said, you know, which was really, really sweet. And she got into the car with Ike. <clears throat> and I think the Ikeettes were also in the car. <clears throat> it's a big limo. They drove off. And I think I saw another show. Um, but that was when I first met Gerhard. Um, and so I had, and so. And what was he like for you? Uh, what nice, you nice, nice. I mean, he wasn't. A bit more, a bit more mellow. I mean, Roger was more of a presence. Gerhard, I felt, was a bit, you know, nice. He got things done. You know, Rhonda was the one that cracked the whip. You know, she was, you know, with the musicians and, the, you know, she was fab, fabulous, fabulous. Try and explain what Rhonda was like to the audience. Rhonda Graham was someone I expect I respected just immensely. She um she did and could do anything. She could work the lights, she was in charge of the band, she was in charge of setting up this the, the stage, she would answer the phone, she would do the correspondence, she would get them on the plane, off the plane, into the hotel. Rhonda did sort of everything. And she cracked the whip. There's no messing. But to me, there was always a heart of gold. To me, there was, well, I mean, she knew, I mean, I have eyes, they have eyes. They know who they're dealing with. She knew that I would never disrespect her, you know? So, I mean, there was an understanding. And so the camaraderie was, was lovely. It was love, she was, she was lovely. And it was always like, when oh. people said that she could be quite stern and strict. Yeah, absolutely. And she could do it with a smile, you know, and then cut you off. But that's her job, you know, and I understand that. I mean, that's my profession. I I, I get that, you know. Um, loved and, and her. Did, and did you ever meet, I mean, this was early on. Did you ever meet Eddie Hampton Armani? Um, where is that? Oh, uh, I know I never. Well, yes, I did meet him just to say hello. Um, in one of Tina's houses, once she was on her own. Um, this is very funny. It's not what you might expect. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see that? Yes, I can see it. Okay, and it's from the I Can Tina Turner fan club. There you go, run by Eddie. Yes. Uh, it's, um, I Can Tina Turner's review. Really, um, so hi everybody. This letter is being presented to you people uh, to let you and friends know how to go about joining the Ike and Tina Turner Review. It's um, to join the fan club of the Ike and Tina Turner Review. You and your friends should write to the president of the fan club, Mr. Eddie E. Hampton. Here is the mailing address to write to him. Uh, Mr. Eddie Hampton, president, Ike and Tina Turner Fan Club, 1310 North La Brea, Inglewood, California. Um, in your letter, please, and then it goes on and on and on. And um, 
and then it's signed by Eddie. Now, when I got this, because, you know, of course I wanted to be a member. I don't know how I first got to hear about it. It would have been maybe in one of the articles or something in Jet Magazine, something like that. But Eddie Hampton, I imagined an older man, like one of the one of the kings of rhythm or something like that, you know. Now to look back and realize he was just a lad, you know. <laughs> It's it's funny. It's it's so much fun. And that I, you know, that I had that. And then there was um I went to there were three houses that I went to when she was solo, still in in um in LA. And it was the third house. And I went to have tea with a friend of mine, Margot Sappington, and the house keeper, her name was Rose. She was an Asian lady, Rose. And she made tea and we were there and there was a sunken area that had um recording device like eight track stuff like that and we were sitting on the floor and then this person came in bouncing in and she said oh hi this is so and so then oh, hi how are you and he went in and that's all I, I that's that was the only time i saw him face to face <laughs> now i know who he was at the time so that I, was eddie at that time but but at the time I at the time I didn't it was just this sort of breeze that just sort of wafted through the through the room and went and disappeared you know right. so he did he didn't join us or anything and um, so Tina was on her own this is out of out of um, context it, so it's Tina, out of the timeline but we'll get back to how that came yeah from. but I yeah. Mean, so at that time, um, you said she had an, an Asian housekeeper called Rose, but Rose. she also brought back Anne Kane. Do you remember her? I used to sometimes send, Anne would sometimes pick up the phone at Bolick. And um, there was one time during the crossover period where the dresses were sort of beginning not to work that um, she asked me to... Ah, because she was on her own. So she asked me to send the dress to, it was Anne Williams, but that was Anne Kane's married name because she was yes. married to one of the temptations or something like that. Exactly. So, she was married to, to, William, to Otis Williams. Otis, yeah. Yes. So I sent the dress <clears throat> and the dress didn't work and it came back. So what happened with the dress is not working was during the review period, the show was basically the same, it was different versions of the same, but the same thing. And, um, and Tina was very flat. So the, the, the fabric was stretch and she didn't need a bra, she didn't need, so I could just do something and it would work and it would be fabulous. <clears throat> when I went to see her, in i want to say it was atlantic city i'm not sure it was at the at the time when rough the album rough came out in uh, 78 okay and so um oh boy all the interlocking stories by that time, she had seen me dance in '77. Yeah, she we have to. We have because there are some great pictures of you and Tina together there. Yeah, her yeah. visiting you in her, my dressing in room. your in your dressing room. My dressing now. room. Yeah. So she had finally seen me dance, and that lit off a whole new aspect of our relationship. And she was inspired and things like. So, um, on my next visit to LA. She picked me up where I was staying. And as we were driving to her house, she wanted to know if I could dance with her because, because the show was, it was her new show. And she said, and I need someone to, you know, hold the stage while I make a costume change and this and that and the other. And I said, oh, Tina, I would love to do it, but I can't because I'm on, under contract with the Joffrey Ballet. I'm not, you know, I just said, I, I can't. She said, I said, but I can I can think of somebody. She said, okay. So I got in I kept in touch with Rhonda, 
And I recommended Michael Peters because Michael Peters had been a year ahead of me at Performing Arts High School. So we had known each other since then and had hung out and had got up to all sorts of mischief and, um, you know, music and this and that. He hadn't done Beat It or Thriller or Dream Girls. He hadn't done any of that yet. Um, and he was a great dancer. And I thought, well, let me give it to my, let, so I put Michael in touch with Rhonda. Michael got the gig and um, not knowing that in a few years time, he'd be choreographing the film of What's Love Got To Do With It. You know, we didn't know that then. And, exactly, uh, that's so interesting. Huh? You know, but and he was so, not the dancer the, because she, she, she brought, when she went solos, she brought in two male dancers, obviously, and that's why she asked you to do this. This was the first time that but she I wouldn't you. have been, I wouldn't have been one of the male dancers. I would have been like a separate thing in between. Oh, so that been, was what you meant. It would have been a solo. Because she had the two male and the two females, but she wanted somebody, a person, because she was thrilled with the way I performed. You know, she thought, oh, that could be really lovely, you know, etc. It'd be like she little... actually wanted you to have the stage by yourself to expose yes. you more to that kind of audience. Yes. Wow, that could, was kind I, of and amazing. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it because I was under contract to Joffrey. I recommended Mar um, Michael Peters. Mm -hmm. And he did it. And then I went to see the show. It was her first cabaret show. Um, Where she was in that male... Uh, white uh, that that suit and with a hat because mm -hmm. i also saw her at caesar's palace so there were different incarnations of that <clears throat> but this was the year there's so much happening but this was the year because i went backstage and aline was there and she had and rough had just come out and had just received a review and um i went back into the dressing room um and she said again she went okay so she'd come over she said feel this it doesn't come off it doesn't come off she'd started weaves she started hair weaves <clears throat> which ultimately she didn't care for because there was too much work to keep tightening them etc and this and she said in this part after mary and all of that this part was sort of standing sort of up it wasn't behaving well she said, mm, you know, whatever. And then she said, oh, and you know what? I'm going to have a little boob job. And then not a whole lot, just to give myself a little bit extra more cleavage, etc. And so that's when the bosom started being um, enhanced. Suddenly something arrived there. And, and uh... when that happened, of course, when you have a bosom, then you need to have fittings because you have to have darts or an underwire, some, you know, something to, you know, to, to make it work, you know, and, and with moving like that, you know, you can't just leave it. So the things that I made didn't, didn't, you know, they, they wouldn't have worked. And then by that time, then it was Mackie, Bob Mackie, and he did the thing with the wings and those things. And then he came out with this outfit that Rhonda speaks about, with just one black stocking. And it was the black, it was his version of the outfit that I had made for Tina that she never wore. Because going back, going with back. With the heart right down the there. Heart, except the heart, like went from, the heart went from the, from the waist, it went to the crotch. Yes. But it was basically, it was the whole, that was the look was, you know, was, was, was that. Um, which is her most outrageous costume ever, I would say. I mean, and what? Yeah, what happened after? So let we go. We go back to Barney Google. So Tina is staying at. It's an. It was a hotel. On Seventh Avenue. In New York, the Americana, I think it was something like that. <clears throat> and I had um, an appointment to meet her about 10.30 in the morning. She'd been performing the night before. <clears throat> so I guess she had a full day and she'd get this out of the way. I don't, you know. So I went and I go into the foyer, into the, you know, into the lobby. 
and there are a couple of eye cats trying to be inconspicuous with all this hair. <laughs> and Rhonda had told me which, you know, what suite she was in. So um, I called up and I went up. And I think I had, oh, and I had two more dresses with me. And I was going to deliver the dresses, spend some time with Tina, etc. <clears throat> so I go up. I don't know if I knocked her if there was a bell, but the suite. And Thomas opens the door in negligee and wig. Again. And again. <laughs> <laughs> she was she was uh she playing, worked it she was she uh, playing that part wasn't she she worked it and she was gorgeous fulfilling that part she was gorgeous and so you know so oh please sit down would you like some tea would you like some coffee okay fine you know i'll get um i'll let tina know that you are here well we've heard a lot about ann thomas but she was supposedly very nice right she was wasn't lovely she? she was lovely 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 demure lovely all of a sudden, I'm sitting there. This person comes into the room. It's Tina, obviously just rolled out of bed, no makeup, just a bandana over her head, no wig, a little blue nighty, barefoot. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. With this Egyptian face, with the cheekbones and the not a stroke of makeup, just wow, breathtakingly beautiful, beautiful, and so different because I'm, you know, you're used to the halo yeah. of hair and all, you know, just nothing, just a blue bandana, little nighty, you know. There was Anne in her, you know, and she looks and Tina looks at Anne. She goes, mm, "Flowing, <laughs> really, wow." So she was. Uh... That a bit of shade, shade there. A bit of shade, yes, you know. And um And we and even really... saw her doing that in that Bob Gruen yes. film. Did you see that yes. when she also yes. Yes. is yeah. giving her a little bit of a yeah. fell off yeah. or some shade there? But sweet, sweet. And so she sits and she's sort of speaking to me in her eyes as you know, etc. Because she'd only just woken up. She'd performed the night before. And um, I gave her the new, and I had some photographs and et cetera. And, you know, she said, oh, and, uh, and can you give, I have to give you this back because it, it just doesn't work. It was the, the one-legged thing, she said, you know, because um, she, I, it fits fabulously. It's real well-made. Everything is fine. But, you know, Ike isn't thrilled now with me in pants or anything like that. So I'm not even going to try. So I said, oh, I said, well, why don't you keep it? You know, maybe for photographs or something. Keep it, you know. It's a, oh, okay, and take this. She took it. So obviously she took it, and then she obviously showed it to Bob Mackey. <clears throat> and he came up with the one stocking instead of the one leg and the, and the so heart. So it was kind of a copy that Bob Mackey did? Was, I would, how can you say? Inspired by, you know. She said, yeah, I'm sure she would have done. Oh, well, this works for me. What do you think about, can you do something like this? Can you, you know, it was that sort of stuff, you know. Um, and, um, but I but I recognized. And when I finally saw it, I said, oh my God, that's sexy Ida. She went. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which was the name of that costume. That was the name of that costume, wow. yes. But I mean, yeah. that that costume in itself, I was a child during her comeback, but uh, then they showed those pictures of her in that particular dress with that heart in front of her down there. And I yeah. mean, it was like quite shocking. You, you'd yeah. never really, see, I mean, and also, you know, on the edge of tacky, right? Ritual How can costume. I be diplomatic? I mean, I didn't have a whole atelier with stitches and beaders and cutters and things like it was just me on the floor with my machine you know so you no know, my garments weren't made like that but my garments were about tina they weren't about anybody else with mackie <clears throat> all the showgirls in vegas had the wings you know it was very glamorous. It was very. It was during her cabaret days, yeah. inspired by what Bob Mackie had done with Cher 
and yeah. with Anne Margaret. Yeah, and all because these- yeah, because if it's interchangeable like that, then it's not about one person. It's a fabulous garment, you know. It's a brand, but if Charo can wear it, and and um, you know Cher can wear it, and Raquel Welch can wear it, and Juliet Prowse can wear it, and this, then it's interchangeable. It's not, and I think I think Tina deserved more than that, a more commitment, more personal commitment than that, you know, than just blah, 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 blah. Although they were fabulously made garments, as garments were fabulous. Well, I think he kind of did that, Bob Mackey, with that very special one that he did. I think he did that one for her with, which was like a bodysuit with pearls on it. And then that huge feather on the, on the- That was lovely. On the- underwear or whatever or sparkling yeah. underwear she was hardly wearing anything it was like that a was bikini with that yeah. that was kind of tina i thought really that was something mm. she wanted that so badly because it was really sort of um well because she was crazy about Anne margaret and they were such good friends um she wanted to feel legitimate in that way you know it was profession was legitimate and she you know bob mackie and you know yeah i get that that was you know great and Margaret and Cher were two two friends and women that she loved and respected very much, more so. Than and that's anybody. how, actually, with Tommy, oh boy, the circle's connecting. I was friends with the president of the Anne Margaret fan club. He was invited to the party for Tommy, for the opening night of Tommy. And of course, Anne Margaret and Tina were there. Tina gave him, it was a cigarette case with just, I think, one or two cigarettes that had Tommy written on it. And and she had, and I think she had written, she'd done Tina Turner or something, or for Chris from Tina or something like that. And she gave it to him, Neil, Neil, I forget his last name, Neil, Neil. So he she gave it to him to give to me when he came back to New York. When he came back to New York, he said, oh, no, you know, Anne says that um, things aren't good between Ike and Tina, you know, that he's, he's, you know, being very brutal with her. You know, I said, no, I didn't, I didn't want to believe it. I didn't want to believe it. So I just pushed it aside. So it was and actually through Anne Margaret who told Neil, her fan club president, yeah. Who told you that yes. Ike was abusing and beating Tina in a way. That's the first time. So that was during Tommy. The, the, so that was 75, 74. Well, they, they did film it in London in 74. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Tina had said, oh, the red dress, you know, she said, because I could have used it, you know, because I could have used it for, for Tommy, etc. And she caught herself immediately because she was always on, you know, business. She said, I mean, like for, for production stills and things, like, not that it would have been in the film. You know, she corrected herself instantly. Um, but um, because then that's why she had it copied in red sequins. So it was, it was sort of the dress, but it was, it was in red sequins. So, so the one she wore in Tommy was not done by you. No, it was, but inspired, it was inspired by your original. The top was. The top was, obviously. And then the bottom was, was a variation on the, you know, the peaks that she had often used before. Mm-hmm. But it had the cutout at the back, everything with the, the top was my how, how many designers did she have or did she use during the Ike and Tina days? Were you the primary one for that, for that, for, for those years? Or did she for have those years. like many, many for those years. designers? Okay. For those years. There was the fellow, oh, and I should know the name, I don't did all the beads, the fringe dresses and the beads and the, the uh, like the outfit she wears in Soul to, in, um, Soul, Soul, to Soul. Um, you know, the sort of see-through bead. She, um, the ones with um, the film in Holland where she does... Um, yes, in 1971. And purple lilac. So there was that. Oh, and there was a fellow. Um, it's a... It's an Asian name. And he did what I call the Egyptian one, which had a belt and a sort of a sort of art deco panel in the front and art deco panel in the back and a bra. 
that one was lovely. It didn't move, but it was it was lovely. And then there were some variations on that that weren't quite as successful. She also and used quite a famous one uh, that she, I think she wore it on the Dick Cavett sh show, but she wore it a lot actually on the stage. And she had some variations of that. In 72, it was red and it was uh, white. And I think she had it in other colors as well, that one going in that, like a mm -hmm. thing here. Yeah, and it's sort then, of crossed over and yeah. Yeah, yeah crossed uh, over, yeah. Yeah, she was... Um... Yeah, there were so there were looks, different looks, etc. You know, because um, earlier on they were just you know the minis for um, like for you know when with the album out of season and you know or the, you know it was just basically minis and then it got more interesting. And did you ever do any uh, clothes for the iCats? I didn't. Esther wanted me to. <laughs> she said, "Oh, you're the one with the you're the one with the rag dresses. Oh, they're great. You should do something for us. Not the same, you know, but just something for." So, there's no way I could. Was Esther the one that you bonded with the most, or, or who? She and 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 Edna and the June, um, because they were the, they were always there. Um, Esther just had a place in my heart. There was just something about uh, the voice, um, real old timer, showbiz. She was, oh, Esther was, I loved me some Esther. She was, she was lovely. God Wonderful. bless her. How many, she I was, mean, um, we, we often hear that a lot of those Iquettes, and there were many sets, that they had to kind of go through Ike, you know? I mean, like, go to bed with him. Mm. Did they all do that? Or do you think, I mean, I Le Shun, for example, was married to Soko. Soko. Yeah. I mean, and I, what about I, Esther? Was, do you know anything about that? I don't. I don't. Because it must have been so difficult for Tina to see all of that and witness uh, all of those things and his adultery and all of the, yeah. I mean, those things. Yeah, I don't could... think Esther, somehow, I don't see that in Esther. But of course, I mean, if somebody like that comes up to you and wants what they want, you you don't say no, you know. So I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't. I don't think she would have worked it. I don't think she was somebody who would have. There were some that I felt, oh, you know, um, but um, I don't think she was like that. Esther was. She was lovely. She lovely. seemed. She seemed a little bit different, didn't she? She was lovely. And did, and did you ever meet or? Did you ever know Judy Cheeks? I no, but I I I had bought, I had bought her LP when it came out, uh, that I produced, and one of the first times um, I met with Tina and Anne was there. I said Anne Thomas. Yeah, I said something about, um, you know, the Judy Cheeks album, and um, and Anne Thomas says, "Oh, you're a real fan." I said, yes, you know, and then I spoke about um, the iCats Gold and New, and Tina went, yeah, no, you know, they, yeah, but I didn't do anything with the music. You know, it didn't, it didn't, you know, she wasn't, um, and it's, it is a little flat, you know, and predictable. Um, but going back to Essex House, because I'm jumping around now, so this is the reception before New Year's Eve at Fillmore East. So I and Tina come in together, cameras, photographs, etc. everyone going crazy. Ike disappears, works one side of the room, Tina goes to the other. I happen to be closer to Ike. So, oh, how are you? You know, love, really nice. So then Tina and I give her the one-legged outfit that she chooses not. She got it immediately. This is different. I won't deal with it now. So she closed, you know, the package again, and she was really nice. And then they went and they, then I came over and, um, you know, she said, um, well, did you see who was here? He said, yeah, 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 yeah. So she said, well, you could say hello. And uh, he said, and um, I said, oh, no, I've, I've spoken to you, you know, so she, oh, okay. And I guess disappears, you know, so that just little, little 
Oh God. So that was when she was starting to talk back to him a little bit. A she little explains bit. this or talks about that in her book. Yeah. You know, so... Um, but other than that, he was nice. We went to see... Um, I have a photograph of the of an ice blue dress that I made for her um, that she loved. And she wore at the Coconut Grove, I think it was, in Los Angeles. And we were in Los Angeles. And it was a show. It was an extraordinary show. She came out through the audience in like a silver sequined kaftan. And she was singing... It was a blues number. It wasn't early in the morning. It was um, it was a blues number, and she was being led through the audience, and then she got up onto the stage, and there was like bam, 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 throw off the silver caf the sequin caftan, and she was there in the ice blue dress, which and everyone went oh, because there wasn't a lot of it. I mean, but it was oh god, she was gorgeous. That's the show that a lot of us fans really would like to see oh. footage of. If we could get like a whole DVD of that show, because yeah. it was so unusual for her to walk through the audience in that long, yeah. what you call a, a, ca a caftan. What would it be a caftan? Like a, a caftan. Well, we have seen pictures of it, but we only. So it would be, if, if she held her arms out, it would be a square mm. of, of silver sequins. And I guess it was fastened in, in the front, or she might have clutched it. And then, then the drum break, and then she just threw it off, disappeared somehow, and she was just there in this in this um, ice blue dress, and she did. They had. Did you do only women bleed, or was that part of? Was that later in that the was, show? That was a little later. And then there was Bayou Song, which was kind of a one on her country. Yeah, album, which was she was. I don't think I ever saw that. I didn't see that live. I've only seen that on television. Just another Louisiana afternoon Drinking homemade liquor Till I'm swooned I tell you I ain't lying I don't talk much Cause my man is crazy Times are hard Things are hazy Oh Lord, and I'm so tired But she sang with um, A Love Like Yours, Don't Come Knocking. She had a couple um, of dancers off to the side. They did a pas de deux. Like, they weren't ballet dancers, but they were, they were lifts and there were things like that while she was singing. So they were playing with the makeup of the review a little bit. And um, she sang... Um, Saying, come on over, baby, a whole lot of shaking going on. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, did she shake, sing that? Baby, that shake. That... Oh, really? Shake, baby, shake. The, the, yes. There, there were some yes. new different numbers in there. Oh, yes. I think they did a revamped, re recorded version of that, which was re released after her solo uh, comeback uh, really? of Shake, yeah. because she had done that originally in the early, early 60s. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. So our table where I was sitting was stage right. So as you look at, because it was, the stage was sort of semicircular. And as you look at the stage, we were on the left-hand side. The, and the, um, the door to the, like the dressing rooms, you could see. So they had to come out and then go up onto the stage. So during the smoke at the end, you know, the, the um, end of the show, um, she makes her exit, passes in front of us, goes through the dressing room door, it swings open, she disappears. Um, Ike comes, makes the exit as the band is dispersing. Ike comes, goes through the door, um, the doors close. Then somehow, like the door, 
somebody else went into the room or something, the door opened again, and Ike was on like a chaise long, like this, and Tina was on her knees, massaging his feet, as though he had just done, you know, three acts of <laughs> La Traviata or something like, you know, I mean, just, she was taking care of, you know, it was just one, it was just like, whoops, <gasps> Ooh, whoops, boom. So then um, I got to go back, because I actually had to pick up an, an envelope because there was some money for me. And um, and Tina still had on the blue dress, the blue dress. She was, everything was fine. And Anne was there, Ike was there. And I said, oh my God, and the dress, she said, yeah, this blue one, you should, it's an expression, you know, you put, you, you really put your foot in this one, boy. You know, which is, so <laughs> she, was, she was, she loved it, you know, and I said goodbye and went off again. So there were, there were these, these moments. Yeah, wow, that's that's something, know. isn't it? And in the um when uh, right before oh boy, the Waldorf Astoria, which was the year that she fled earlier on in the year. Yeah, they had a run there in April or something, right? I mean they had like they had yeah. residency there for yes a few weeks or something. Yes. And the first night that I went, she didn't wear one of my dresses. Um, but I had spoken to Rhonda to get in touch with Rhonda to go up to the suite. And um, it was, I was with my friend Gary again. And so we had, we'd gone up. The first time I went up, I think by myself, when it was with Gary, we went, there was the first show. And then for, I saw where the band came on. I didn't realize that you had to bribe the maitre d' to get a really good seat because you bought tickets. And I paid, you know, for the best tickets. But my seat was, you know, not, it wasn't ringside, you know, so I figured that out. Um, so after the first show, we seated at the table. So I followed where the band had exited, etc. And they were like, oh, you know, so I said, um, you know, is um you know is Rhonda here, etc. And they were like, you know, Rhonda, you know, well, he didn't ask for he didn't ask for Tina, he asked for Rhonda, so it must be okay. So um so they gave me Rhonda's number. So I called Rhonda and Rhonda put me through. And she said, yeah, you can come up, come up. And I said, there's a friend of mine, Gary's with me. He said, you know, that'll be okay. So we go up. And I had two more dresses with me. And it was an adjoining suite. So I, I realized was in one part. And Tina was had the other part. And there were some, like three or four ladies who I think were her Brazilian... Buddhist ladies, now that I look back, um, three girlfriends were there. They were Portuguese, Brazilian. And I gave her the new dress, etc. <clears throat> By this time, she hadn't seen me dance yet. But she knew what I did. And she knew I was with a company and that we toured, etc. And she started to pick my brain about, you know, well, Chris, um, like when you tour, do you have like the same lights each time? And like, do you have the same stage? I said, yes, we have what's called Marley. It's like a linoleum and it's laid down on the floor, you know, with tape. So we always have the same surface and we have our own proscenium frame so that regardless of how big the theater or small the theater, we have, we're, work we're working within the same framework. You know, and we have the shin busters and we have the different lights and the this and that and the other. And, oh, and what about the costumes? And you wear the, and she was like picking my brain. She was already moving on. She wanted to know all the secrets. And, um, and then halfway through our conversation, you know, Tina! Yes, I could. <laughs> okay, I didn't. And she goes, Anyway, so da -da -da, and she goes on, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, I said, what time is it? She said, oh, um, 
say, oh my God, well, the show's about to be, the, the iCat's going to be on, aren't they? So, oh, you want to see that? I said, well, I, th I thought really quickly. I said, well, yes, because it's such a nice setting for you. It really builds, you know, it's, it's, oh, okay. And um, Gary and I went down and we stood by the side because we were coming from backstage. We stood by the side and the exit door is right there. You know, well, she was it. already in costume when you were talking to her in the in the suite. She was getting about to get ready. And she said that there was another one. She was it was going to be a red sequin one. Not the not the Tommy one, another one that she said, you know, oh, you know, and I wore this the other night, you know, but she said, oh, you know, I looked in the mirror and it was sort of, you know, I didn't like, it was sort of like a, a hooker or something. I didn't, you know, so I had the fishnet stockings and I sort of did it sort of burlesque, you know, and that, you know, so she, you know, so she was really evaluating, you know, what she, how she looked and what she was going to wear. <clears throat> so we went down and we stood. Now, where we were standing, <clears throat> we were really sort of looking almost profile. So we could see what she was presenting to the audience. And then we could see her demeanor when she was facing upstage and with Ike. And it was a little bit like, you know, um, there's this old sort of trick, you know, where you do smile and then you do, and then you just smile. So from the front, and it was like, get back to where you're down, da, da, and then she turned back and it was like, you could see the rage. It was like, oh my goodness. And then Ike was saying, he threw something at them um, that wasn't um, planned. Somebody passed a note down to the front of the stage. She picked it up and she said, um, Ike, she said, Ike, I can't stop loving you. And she thought it was like a fan, it was a, a man putting in you know, it. She was like, and he went, and he went, and just bum, bum, bum. I can't stop loving you. Just like that, out of the blue. And the Ikets just chimed in, three part harmony. And then she sang the vocal. Um, what would, what, you know, um, impromptu, just like that. Just like that. Somebody, you know, fan had just come, you know, I, you know, like, would you play? He didn't, except it wasn't, would you play? And she thought it was like a, come on, you know, Ike, I can't stop loving you. No. And they went, they did the whole number. It was fabulous. Wow. But not nice for her. She always had to be ready to do the unprepared, right? She never knew. She never knew. The key, everything, the, the three-part harmony, everything, fabulous. And then I think Tom Jones was in the audience and she wanted to know, it was one of she'd finished a number, you know, thank you, thank you very much. We do thank you very much, etc. cetera. And um, she's always back looking at Ike and can I go ahead, could I not go ahead? And um, she knew that Tom was in the audience and she went up to him and she said something like, um, because we could see from the profile, you know, is this a good time to introduce, you know, Tom? And he went something like, Pff. I mean, it was like, almost like, you know, what the fuck, you, you know, that sort of stuff, you know. And she went, and there's someone very special now in the house tonight, and you know, et cetera, said, like, on stage. And then at the end, during the smoke bomb, at the end, she makes her exit, she makes her exit, and she rushes past us, and the doors don't open. And so she's going and the smoke is coming and she's down the stairs and she goes to boom. And the doors don't open and she has to pull them open. And go, it was like, oh my God. And the expression on her face was, was pain. You know, there was like angst on her, pay, on her face. And the next show, there was someone waiting by the door to open the door for her, you know. So it was tough. It, it's, there's such extraordinary moments. Yes, and it was a, so it was a sense, it was a feeling of tension and anxiety, mm. be mm. on guard, be her being on guard and mm. and not being at ease 
I mean, certainly yeah. was, this was a different Tina from, you know, from later on yeah. when she was on her own and in control yeah. of, of everything. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you actually got to see that. And did you know what it was all about? In broad strokes. In broad strokes, yeah, I could, you know, connect the dots. And then there was another, I was doing another dress, and I would always call Berlick Sound <clears throat> and ask for Rhonda. So I'd call, this is after after the Waldorf Astoria. So I called Berlick Sound, I asked for Rhonda. I'm sorry, Rhonda's no longer with us. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, because Rhonda le left just before Tina, as we as I had discovered never, yeah. later. And then I called up, you know, said, you know, well, I have a dress. I, I want to send it for Tina. Oh, I'm so sorry. And Tina's no longer with us. Oh, OK. And then I didn't hear anything for weeks. Heard nothing. Heard nothing. Heard nothing. Heard nothing. Tina is no longer with us? Yeah. Did they say that? That was, that? That? That was, that was the, the route you know, um, reply. Uh-huh. So that was when she left on the, well. So um, I, I was July. in New York. I was in New York and I was, as far as I knew, I was going to make more dresses, you know, so I, all of a sudden. And the it didn't make the front page of the, of the newspaper, certainly. Nobody knew. No. So the line of communication was mm. severed. But it was, it was really strange. And then I read um, an article in the New York Times or the New York Post or something, where Tina had been pulled over, and um, for a traffic violation, and there was a gun in her per in her purse or something like that, and she was taken in. So, because also before then, going way back with the review, there was also the headline of the um, was it the Black Panthers when yes. there was a brawl on the stage, and so I read, you know, I was making dresses during that time. I thought, oh my goodness. But I never inquired about that. I knew better than to ask about that. And, um, but this was, you know, Tina with a gun. That's so weird. And so, like, a long time, like six, eight weeks went by, and I, nothing, nothing. I'm in my home in New York. The phone rings. Hi, Chris. Tina. I said, Tina? I said, I just have to, she goes, <laughs> I said, no, you know, well, well, I knew, I knew there were, there'd be a couple of people that would be really sort of worried about me because I hadn't, you know, but, um, so I wanted to give you a call. I said, oh my God, Tina, is everything, yeah, yeah, everything is fine. I said, she said, I'm just not, I'm not with all those people anymore. And, um, I wanted to let you know. I said, well, Tina, how can I help? Can I do any, do you need, um, do you need, um, um, you know, so an, another costume. So she, she had said, you know, she's trying to find work and doing things. And she said, oh, no, that'd be great. But, you know, but I, I can't pay. I said, oh, no, Tina, it's not about that. It's not about that. You know, she said, um, she said, no, I just wanted to let you know, if you ever want to get in touch with me, call Rhonda. This is Rhonda's number, because um, I'm moving from house to house. And um, Rhonda will give you the number up at the new house. So, you know, we can keep in touch that way. And um, I'm doing okay. I'm all right. I'm all right. But say a prayer for me, okay? I said, yes, of course, Dino, you know, and that was it. Well, what about all of those wives I had? Who was trying to pretend to be Tina and oh the white and the white one it was that, sort of I, appealing in a sort of yes yeah, she had a very nice smile and everything yeah, but I mean I went and, to see him when he made his um, comeback his debut in New York I just bought it to I said I have to go and see yeah, it. Yeah. and it was, he was right back in the seventies the, the only thing was the eye were coarse I felt. I felt they were crude when Tina yeah. got outrageous you know with I've been loving you too long it was an act. Yeah. Or she would make fun of it. Or yeah. she was looking down at it and smiling yeah. and winking. She wasn't she and wasn't she was still she in control in of it or pretending to be, even though Ike was there pulling the strings. But I mean, had it been one of his wives doing that or somebody oh, been, I been mean, it would have been just so un it would be so unacceptable, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, and unfortunately you can see uh, her, their son Ronnie whom she he married that that Afida Turner. Oh my God! What oh my is God. that? It's, it's it's like next level of bad. Yeah.
I mean, and so, there's Tina I mean, in the photographs with her, just smiling, just gracious. Yeah. <laughs> And then we started, um, then I started going to LA and going to the different houses. The first time she drove me to her house, which was on Sunset Crest Drive, I think it was. Um, oh, and she was so proud. She was so proud because it was, she said, you know, this, this is, this is like, because we're going up in the hills, you know, and it's, you know, this is, um, and she had a um, Mercedes with a sun rooftop, etc. I mean, at the time I realized it, now I realized it was rented, but at the time I didn't, you know, but she had the accoutrement. And um, she said, now this, this is so much more, it's sort of European-y. It's more European-y. She's taking me to, up to the house and, um, and we have a lovely time. Um, and then there was another time, and then there was always, you know, always whenever I was in town and she would cook for me, you know, it wasn't, she'd go to the fridge. It wasn't, you know, not a three course meal, but it was like frankfurters and um, scallions and carrots or something, or it was, you know, I mean, just something, you know, and if other people were there, she said, no, no, it's not for you. He's got to rehearse. So he needs, you know wonderful 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 generous in that sense you know she didn't have to do that tina then, was not a diva like a lot of those um uh, well divas that we that we know uh, no. of, uh obviously and she was quite unusual she was not a prima donna in that way right even no. though she probably could be a little bit strict uh mm. and uh and controlling as mm. we've heard about uh mm. as well from from different people but she was different than she wasn't like the others because she'd never had a life like that no she was she was extraordinary and when she saw me dance there was an article that came out in the LA Times that, uh, that an article on me. And of course, in all my articles, I mentioned, you know, I designed for Tina Turner and she saw the article. And when I called Rhonda, she gave me the number, the house, you know, I spoke to T. Was that the time? Might have been because I called and um, I think, so I call the number and I get, um, hello? I said, oh, um, is Tina there? I'd like to speak to Tina. Oh, um, can I ask who's calling, please? I said, this is Christian. Oh, hi, Chris. So she's putting on a, she was putting on a, a voice because she didn't know who was, I mean, there was no caller ID in those days, you know. So oh, so she, she was imitating, yeah, she was putting on a voice. Just in case it was to someone be... to do with Ike or, you know, you just didn't know. So she was putting on she was this strange persona. And then once she realized it was me. That's she, totally what Eddie said in his book. And also mm. told me that they were sometimes, uh, that they would answer the intercom if somebody pressed the buzzer and pretend to be uh, yeah. the, the Asian housewife or a, yeah. a house uh, housekeeper yeah. preparing for her acting career, huh? And she said, you know, so I said, oh, you know, I'm going to be, she said, yes, you know, this is what, come over to the house. So I came over to the house and um, we spent some time together. What year was this, Christian? This would have been seven, she saw me in 77. So it would have been, it would have been 77. So, it would have so been that, 1977. So 77, she actually got her own house and after she had been cleaning she had been working as a maid, basically, for some of her friends. 
For for Wayne, yeah, for Wayne Shorter. Wayne Shorter. Um, Wayne Wayne Maria was Shorter. Wayne was sweet. I mean, I I did Gongyo with Wayne. Gongyo is the ceremony where you recite uh, Lotus Sutra, etc. And I went to see him at the Barbican. He was here in in London, and um, went backstage, and we had, um, and I'm friends with his with his widow, his second his second wife, um, Carolina. Um, but we went, and it, I guess it was Royal Woods. I forget where. There was Sunset Crest Drive, and there was Royal Oak, Royal Oak something. There was a different house. Royal Oak, I've heard of. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was that one. I think it was that one. And um, so she said, oh, you know, I, this is great. Look at the article and look at you, isn't it? In fact, I have the article. Um, oh, let let us see that. This is this is the fellow with whom I usually stayed in Los Angeles. This is at Caesar's Palace. Um, when she was opening for, was she opening for Bill Cosby? I'm not sure. No, she was opening for Buddy Hackett. So this is where. Let's see where we are. You can see. So it's try and tilt the picture a little bit. There we go. Can you make that out? So it's my um a little bit a little bit more uh yeah right into the camera. I don't know how we can do that because it's a bit difficult to see it actually. Yeah. So a little bit more. Is that you? That's me. In my salad days. So um, as you look at it from right to left, it's Michael McGrail with whom I stayed. He's gone. In fact, everyone at that table is gone except me. There's me, uh, Danny Pounds, and I forget this other fellow. And we're at um, Caesar's Palace to see Tina. And um, so I go up to um, Royal Oak Woods, I think was the name of the. It's in Sherman Oaks or something like that. And she finds out, um, she sees the article, which I can't find now. But she says, no, I want to see this. I want to see this, you know, because I was going to go away. But no, I'm going to stay. I want, I want, I want to see this. I said, oh, great. Wonderful. I said, well, there are two nights. The first night I do a solo. And then the closing night is nice. And it's actually a rock ballet. We have a rock group that plays with us. So that'll be the first night's a, a gospel solo that I did and uh, that I performed. And then the second night, the closing night is um, the, the rock ballet. So you, 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 I think you'll love it. Oh, great. Okay. Okay, fine. So she comes over to Michael McGrail's house, picks me up. Um, she was early. Oh, God. And my first thought, and it was like, there was like, a, there was the door, and then there was like a screen door. And my initial response was, oh, my God, it's Tina. I can't keep her waiting. So, I mean, I was ready, but I had to go get my dance bag and go, and there were some other people in the in the house, and I didn't know how Tina would be with other people, you know, etc. So she rings the bell, and I go and I open the go, I open the door, and I go and go go, oh, Tina, oh, and I I like I let go of the door, and of course it closes. <laughs> I don't get to get my. She's just like so, and then luckily Michael, the host, comes. And I explained after I said, Tina, I just didn't want to leave, you know, keep you waiting. So I said, oh, that's okay. So we get in, we get in the Mercedes. And um, she's driving me to the Greek theater. She had a weave. Because closing night, she had a wig. But this first night, she had a weave. And it was sort of frizzy. It wasn't an afro, but it was frizzy. And it was quite lovely. And she said, she, you know, she just liked to try different looks now. I mean, I'd seen her, she had her hair in a ponytail. She did things that she never did with Ike, you know. And um, so it was this frizzy sort of look. It was beautiful. Um, she was on, you know, she was um, driving. I was in the passenger seat. We were listening to Kiss FM. And her two favorite songs were... Fleetwood Mac, um, thunder only happens when it's raining, 
You know, when the rain washeth you free, you know, washeth you clean, you know, you know, because it was, it was, it was about the freedom. It was about ending a relationship, and it was about the freedom. And she's singing this along to Kiss FM, at the top of her lungs, with her foot on the pedal in ankle straps and the most the fabulous three inch heel. It was like, oh my god! And people are driving by, and they're going, <laughs> "Wow, that!" Must I mean, amazing, and huh? the sunroof, etc. And the other song that she loved at that time was. Um, Easy, the Commodores, Lionel Richie. Um, Cause I'm easy, easy like a Sunday morning. Because there's a, there, in the verse, um, it says, um, why, would, why would anybody wanna put chains on me? I paid my dues to make it. And it was she related to that, you know? And she's singing at the, top of her lungs and we're driving through the hills going to the Greek theater. So we go to um, Robert Joffrey, who was the director of the company. He was fabulous, but um, it was always, it could be slightly difficult because he would like to maybe if the, if the theater allowed it to put like all the boys in one big room, all the girls in one big room, you know, it was never, dressing rooms are always an issue. And I, we were in LA and he knew that we knew people in the business that were going to be coming back and you can't entertain them if you're in a room full of guys, you know. Um, I thought, no, so I went to see Dottie. Dottie was our wardrobe mistress, Dottie Kosher. So I went to see, he said, Dottie, if Gary and I take our costumes from you and we take them up to, a, it's a lovely little dressing room for just, it, I mean, it seats 10 people. It would be just Gary and me. If we take our dress, if I take our costumes up and then bring them back at the end of the evening, you know, would you mind if we, you know, because we just need some privacy because we're expecting people backstage. You know, oh, sure, hon. Don't we? Yeah, 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 go ahead. And it's fine. So we had our, it was Gary and me in a dressing room. Um, Tina, the, the, the valet, parks the car. We're walking in through the stage door. People are like, because it's a ballet crowd, but of course they know who, they knew who I was, but of course they knew who Tina was. It was like, it's okay. So we go in, we're a little late. Gary's getting ready. We go, I throw my all my stuff down on the, um, on the table, the dressing room table. And Tina puts all, empties her handbag out. And so she's putting on her makeup and I'm putting on my makeup, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And then she goes out. Um, um, Philip Penner had taken over from Jay Stover. And so Philip was now um, sort of in production and he escorted her. To, but she was escorted out to the house. You know, she had a house seat, et cetera. And I did this... Um, I did this solo, it was a gospel solo um, to Reverend, uh, Reverend James Cleveland and the Charles Fold Singers. It's called Touch Me. And the costume was, wasn't really ethnic. It was, I had to pick a way of doing it that employed more classical lines because the first thing people would have thought was, oh, it's Alvin Ailey. And that wasn't what I did or I didn't want it to look like. So I tried I tried to be as balletic with it as possible with lines and stuff. Although it was got, and also, I mean, I was raised Church of England and this was Baptist. So, I mean, I didn't worship that way. So I had to really invest and come up with a way to respond to the music. So, um, the costume was, um, it was actually like a pair of culottes, which are like wide, wide trousers. So when you cut, um, you can cut a circle of fabric. And this was like a circle and a half of fabric. And that was just for one leg. And then there was a circle and a half of fabric for the other leg. And then it sat on the hip bone, etc. And the fabric was accordion pleated. So it, it did this, and it was white jersey. It was really quite lovely. 
and it moved and I went down to the floor and I wrapped myself in it and all this sort of stuff. So I do the I do the the solo. I can hear Tina yelling bravo. It's like, what's wrong with this picture? She's supposed to be on stage. I'm supposed to be in the audience yelling bravo. <laughs> I'm hearing Tina Turner yelling bravo. Okay, so she comes back. She says, oh my God, Chris. Oh, I did. I had no idea. I had no. Oh my God. And when you did that thing, and look at and the costume, because you know, Bob Mackey's making me wings and they're like accordion pleated. And I saw you and you're using the skirt, the you know, the trousers, and you have the accordion pleated. And I just got so many ideas. And oh, and this is oh, and how did you get she dropped to her knees? So how do you do those bores on the knees? You travel from one side of the stage on the other, and your knee, and she's on her knees and it's like, it's like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, you know, re she was really bowled over. It was wonderful. So, oh, well, then I have to come and see this. I have to come and see the second show. I have to come closing night. I'll do that. So closing night, she gets, she takes the wrong turning on the highway or something. So Bernadette, who was Craig's girlfriend at the time, Bernadette picks me up and drives me to the house. And I'm sitting there and Craig is sort of hovering around. Bernadette's there and they go about their business. Tina comes in holding a little wig um, headstand with a wig on it. Oh my God, Chris, I'm so sorry. You know, I got lost on the highway and, you know, I had a fitting with Bob Mackey and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. You know, have you eaten? I can just do a quick something like a minute steak or something. You're fine. And then she goes and she changes. She didn't have a makeup or anything like that. And then she, um, she said, okay, no, we can go, we can go. Then she said, um, um, Rhonda's coming. I got a ticket for Rhonda. So I said, okay. So Rhonda came with one of the dancers whose name was Debbie, I think, who was uh, mm, about this color, this color, brown. And um, so Rhonda comes and she said um, she wasn't sure about, were we all going to go in one car? We're we going to take Rhonda's car and then Tina and I'll be in the other car and who's going to take the and um so we figured finally we so i was late but i was the last ballet on the program so i was okay but uh, you have to sign in at half hour and so i'd missed that but i knew gary would do it for me you know so so we go and she this time she's in um well, with in the photographs you'll see it's a short wig white beautiful white suit and these these shoes and so we get to the we get to the Greek theater and we're late and we jump out of the car and every, the, you know it's like the sea like the red sea that everyone parts and we're going we're running in to the stage door and there's Hans Hans Hortig and he goes hmm better late than never so I said hi Hans <laughs> so we go and everyone's like oh so we go in and we Dash, I think Rhonda goes straight out to her seat with Debbie. Tina comes back, puts on some makeup, etc. Is taken out because it's the uh, it's the last ballet that I'm in. And at the end, we had bought um, a little sort of ice box, like a little chest, where a little refrigerator, really, not even hip height, but you could um, I was stocked with champagne. And I'd gone for, because we had like, it was LA and there were people coming back and, you know, wanted to entertain people. So we had like six bottles of champagne and glasses and stuff like that for afterwards. So we do this ballet called Trinity. First thing, in, in going back to Touch Me, the bow for Touch Me was basic, when I came out, I wouldn't say it was grand, but it was, um, when I studied with Graham with, at the Martha Graham School, there was a sit that you did. You stood on one leg, you crossed the other behind you, and you sank to the floor with a straight back. And um, and that's how I would bow and then get up, et cetera, et cetera. Years later, in the arenas, there's Tina sinking to the floor and being very balletic with the bows and all of that. That was the she Joffrey Ballet. That, always. Because, because she said, you know, oh, Chris, this is so great. This is so great, you know, and I'm I'm really inspired. And she said, you know, well, I'm 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 not I'm not gonna steal, but um um 
I'm going to incorporate. And she did. And she did. Um, God bless her. So I felt that, you know, she was, I inspired her for a change. You know, and she was able to pick up things. And Wasn't so the rock amazing there, suddenly for you to go, I mean, go in that direction. And, and Tina getting, you know, she... She had a lot of respect for you after seeing yeah. you perform and yeah. seeing your craft and, and your talent. Yeah. And and she she got inspired by that. And it was like oh, full circle. It, it was like a different kind of balance between you, wasn't it? It was wonderful. It because she learned. She learned um and she um she learned the grandeur, you know, of, of And had of, she ever seen ballet or anything like that before? Not you? before, not before, no. And you see, we were also dancing to rock and roll. Um, it was, well, it was sort of like, um, it was a sort of, the 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 the, um, the score was not, I mean, it could have been Tower of Power or um, not Chicago, Blood, Sweat and Tears, you know, um, well, Chicago, you know, it was, it was brass and then it had a funk beat underneath it. And, you know, so it, it was that. And um, and so she came back on fire and all sorts of people were flooding into the dressing room and Tina was perched on my dressing table. Just like, <laughs> <laughs> it was like fabulous. And then Michael Peters came back because um, he didn't know he'd be dancing with her, you know, but of course he knew who she was. And Lester Wilson, the choreographer, um, Lester was the one who choreographed um, Saturday Night Fever and everything that everyone does this you know that's actually Lester's choreographer choreography we didn't we didn't do that in, in Studio 54 that was his choreography but it's gone down as that's how people dance but Lester was there um, some Hollywood actors were there um, Thelma Houston came back with Lester and she was introduced to um, Tina. And the first Tina was like, oh. And then because Hip Thelma at that time had just had her hit with um, um, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. Um, Don't leave me this way. Yeah, and Tina, Tina da, 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 did that song on the da, stage da, 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 the year after. So all of a sudden she didn't really, then she said, Hip Thelma. So it was two recording artists and they were like sisters. Oh, and they did cetera. And then Rhonda came in, Rhonda came in with Debbie. And then the photographs were taken, and it was just a fabulous, fabulous. And did Rhonda yeah. take those pictures? No, Michael McGrail took the photographs of me and Tina. Um, Rhonda did take pictures, but I never saw them. And um, and Rhonda was so thrilled to see Tina um, inspired and happy, you know. And to, and then Rhonda knew me and had never seen me, so it changed our relationship, you know. It yes, was exactly. Wonder it was way, wonderful. Yeah. And then we took the photographs and then Tina said, well, I, you know, I got to go. I got to go. So she said, OK, well, we'll speak. I said, Tina, I'll take you back to your car. No, no, because you've been performing. I said, no, no, don't be silly. I'll, I'll, I'll take you back to your car. OK, OK. So as she's leaving, she turns, as she's going out the door, she turns, she says, bye, everybody. <laughs> and everyone goes, bye. <laughs> and she... <laughs> And she's out the door. And um, so we, um, I took her to her, walked her to her car. And she was all bubbly and melting. And, you know, she was just so happy. And she said, oh, Chris, you have no idea, you know, because this is like, you know, that, that, that. And I said, oh, well, Tina, it's so lovely to be able to do this for you, you know, because you've always been entertaining me. And now she said, oh, you don't, you have no idea. So that happened in LA. So she, when she saw me, which is why then she invited me to dance solo for her, which I couldn't do. And when I recommended Michael Peters, then she went solo and she met Roger Davis, who became her manager and who yeah. took her to greater stardom than she could ever have imagined, obviously. But when you met Roger, what was that like? You still did costumes for her in her um, early solo days? No, because by that time, she wasn't doing Mackie, but she was doing sort of rock and roll. I think, had she done, no, she hadn't done the Ritz yet, <laughs> but she was, it was more leather and denim. So it wasn't something that I felt left out of. It had changed. 
and we were in, um, it was open air New York City, and she was changing, her dressing room was in a sort of a trailer, a caravan, um, and I was there in the dressing room, and she wanted to know, she said, oh, and I have nothing, you know, where am I going to go in between, there's another show, and, you know, on another day, and what am I going to say, oh, well, Bowie's in town, I didn't, Bowie's in Oh, I can do, oh, yeah, I can go and see Bowie's. And then, da, 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 then Roger Davies came in, you know. Oh, Roger, um, this is Christian. He sort of went, leant over and he looked straight in me and through me because I realized now that he was seeing who could stay, who couldn't, you know, who was acceptable, who was young blood, who was, you know, so he was giving me the um, the once over. But he was really, really nice. And that was the first time I saw her sing a Steel Claw. Um, so that would have been right before the Ritz. Um, there is a letter I'd like to read, if I may. I have to, forgive me, I have to use this because my eyesight's not that great and it's not that bright here. So this is um, a letter that was sent to me on... Parmelia Hilton International, which is in Australia. And it's the most lovely letter. Melts my heart. Again, when, I have to... When is it from Christian, that letter from Tina? Um, it doesn't... It's not dated. But it would be... We can figure it out. So she's on tour um, at the and her career is taking off. So it says, Hi, Chris. You're right. I'm ready for a lot of time all by myself. Smile. I'm in Australia. It's been 200 performances, 200 performances in, starting February 5th. Um, not counting traveling. The book, oh, okay. Not, not counting traveling. The book... The book will be out early New Year. So that's I, Tina. That's I, Tina. Yeah. But so that's in book, 86. Yeah. So the book will be out in the new year. I'm fine, but a bit... I'm fine, but a bit burnt out at the at this stage. You can... At this stage, you cannot imagine how frantic it is. Um... It is. Uh, oh, you cannot imagine how frantic it is at the top. Black organizations trying to claim you. Um, protestings, because she'd been to South Africa and they protested. Protestings, um, charities, press, TV, media, and friends wanting your time. It felt so good. to read your letter and know that there is someone you know with a sound mind that knows in spite of the fact that you couldn't get backstage or sending letters to the office and never a complaint, just there and knowing that, just there and knowing that I am and I am. You're still my friend, but I'm busy and tired. And when I rest, you'll hear from me. Um, thanks for understanding. Yes, I'm still at 3872 Royal Woods Drive, um, 91403. But dispose of the address as they're sending so much mail there. Um, which I don't, which I I don't understand. Rather, how they got the address. Um, hang in there, Chris. Um, loved hearing from you. Received your new number from. Received your new number, but lost it, and felt that I would hear from you eventually. Love, Tina. I mean, what do you wow. do when you when you get something like that? And that she took the time to do it, you know. Yeah, and, also and took the time. I mean, this, the, the, 
it, well, it dates it certainly. It must have been on the private dancer tour because, yeah. and that and was hand, in '85 you know, going into handwritten, 80. you know, handwritten. And she was in Australia. She was on tour in Australia. So we can figure it out, you know, when she was in Australia, etc. It probably was because the private dancer tour was all throughout '85, and then it went into '86. Yeah. So she talks about the new year, and then she had the rest of the F '86 off, and that was when she did break every rule. Yeah. So that she would have been extremely tired. That that was her biggest tour yeah. ever, and that was the in the middle of her comeback. And it was, I mean, she couldn't be a she couldn't have been a bigger star at that time. Yeah. Certainly. And this is a little earlier, I think, and this is on Fairmont Hotel stationary but it's not it's not dated and i think there might be is there a... well the fairmont hotel was when she did the those hotels in the late 70s right yeah right. or maybe early I'm trying early to see 80s. if there's because i can't even see with the postage if there's a stamp i can't read the date but this is another lovely letter um dear chris such a lovely dress okay so i was still so this is the 70s so i was still designing Dear Chris, such a lovely dress, and also to hear from you, even though it takes me, even though it takes me longer to answer, I'm always thinking of you. I'm changing lots at the, I'm changing lots of things in my life. Just moved the last three months, changing management in a hundred days, also have changed record company. Don't know yet what company, but I'll inform you. Um, I'll, but I'll inform you. There will, there will definitely be changes this decade. Um, wish me, wish me luck. I'll give you all info at the bottom of, at the finish of the letter and might be coming to New York soon. And when it's definite, I'll let you know. Um, as always, Tina Turner, and it's signed 3872 Royal Woods Drive. Um, just, and then this is from Ron. That, that, that must have been maybe at the er, in the early 80s or maybe around 80. 80, 81, because she knew about the changes. And I had just so sent her a dress. So, oh, although I did a couple of things once she left Ike. So, um, you know, so it might have been. Um, but didn't you do a, the fame, a famous top that you did for Private Dancer? I did a dress. Blouse yeah. or something? Yeah, I did a top for her, which was also, it was metallic, but uh, she wore it under the leather top when she opened at, um, um, when she's singing, let's pretend we're married, go, 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 when she's doing um, Prince. She wore it there and she's exactly. wearing it. That was for a long time during the private dancer tour. Yeah. And even even before, well, it was around that time, she did there was a very it was a famous costume underneath that leather and the tight yeah. leather That's pants. That's it. And it had originally been a dress. I gave it to her in New York. And she didn't she was changing, you know, was she wearing short dresses? Was she wearing pants? Was she you know, et cetera, et cetera? So she I don't think she wore it as a dress. But she kept the top of it, and that was that was the T-shirt. That that little top, the silver top, when it was a dress, <clears throat> because I knew that she wasn't making a lot of money, and you know she was robbing Peter to pay Paul and all of that. And I guess it's the English in me, the British conservative part of me. Um, she said, no, but no, I can take this, um, you know, so how much is this, Chris? How many? And I went into my, you know, oh, well, actually, Tina, I don't know, because I mean, after, while, after all, we haven't worked together for so, you know, I was being, you know, I was doing that. And she said, oh, don't do that, Chris. And I went, oh, oh, and I started to laugh and she went, you know, but she wasn't, she didn't, it was just get on with it. You know, I don't have time. How much do you want? Yes, no, boom, go. You know, so little things like that. And I learned from that. It was wonderful. 
wonderful yeah. so she was um it was she was it, she was e educational in a way which she's been for a lot of people huh who's oh, worked with her it was wonderful a, a pretty tough school also actually and she didn't and where she came the way she came up there was no there was no time for you didn't make mistakes you did not make mistakes because god knows what your punishment would be you know you did not make mistakes and the, that part of her all also um you know she transferred that for the for the rest of her life and she would be on the back on the back of this photograph um stupidly i trimmed it off because it could fit in a frame um you have this you know it's this one this was this was given to me um <clears throat> This was given to me at um, Olympia Drive at the house before I went home. Or was it at the studio? Was it at Bolick? Probably because it's in the seventies. Probably around seventy. Oh no, it's no, it's seventy four. I'm trying to think if she gave it to me at Bolick Sound, or if we'd already gone to the house. I think she might have given it to me because I said, "Oh, do you have a photo?" It was at the house. It was when I was waiting for the taxi. <clears throat> You know, and it says to a wonderful person, my friend and designer, Christian, Latina Turner, 74. But on the back, and it's sort of worn away, she wrote, she chose to write, may we remain friends throughout our business the transactions. So she had already differentiated between friendship and business, you know, and that one doesn't necessarily negate the other, doesn't necessarily negate the other from the very beginning. But she already felt that there was something special about you. I think so. Well, I think from how she received the dress and then my letter to her and realizing the circumstances and the fact that she'd just begun chanting and that she was chanting and then I materialized. And that's how that happened in Kansas City. You know. Very, very interesting. Yeah, very important. She was one of the things she was doing, apart from all her um, um, her, her psychics and this and that, was called rebirthing. She was practicing, she was looking into, re, it was called rebirthing. And she felt, or she recognized that she, apart from the Egyptian connection, she felt that she had been a French music hall artist, sort of around the Toulouse-Lautrec era. And she felt very strongly about that. And at the time, Lucas, I was choreographing The Merry Widow for San Francisco Opera. And of course, The Merry Widow takes place at Maxime's and, you know, this and that and the other. And they have this number called... Um, it's um, Les Belles Grisettes, and um, it's the Can-Can. Et tu ris, et tu ris, et voilà les belles, les belles Grisettes, les Grisettes de Paris, et tu ris, et tu ris, et tu ris, et tu ris, and there's always like a, um, it can be like a guest singer singing that. It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be a classical voice. You sell the number. I mean, Eartha Kitt could have done it. You know, it could have been, you know, it, it, you sell the number and it's fab. And um, it was at the time when Tina was doing um, Hollywood Squares and the Donnie, Mar Donnie Marie and Rhonda was really trying to get her work. And, um, and she had come to me with this thing, you know, with rebirthing that, you know, she'd felt she had been a French musical. I said, oh, she said, because I'm, and I, I spoke to her, you know, because I'm I'm choreographing, you know, The Merry Widow, and I know the um, artistic director of the company, and I know he loves Tina. Maybe I can get something going. Would, you know, would Tina perhaps care to guest, be a guest artist with San Francisco Opera just to do that? And Rhonda goes, Are you looking for work for Tina for me? And I went, yeah. She went, oh. 
I mean, just innocent, but I was. I thought, how can I? And I put her in touch. What, but was never... she saying that in a like a negative, annoying no, way? I, it, was was it, like, it was like, oh my God, like, you know, boy, what are you, you know? It, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't like um, get back. It wasn't like threatening or anything like that. It was, um, she was like, Christian, are you, you know? And I said, yes, of course, Ron. I said, oh, okay. But then I put her in charge with uh, Lof, Lof, uh, Lot, Lotvi was his name. Lotvi Mansuri. He was, um, originally he was um, Persian. Um, and he was the, um, he was the director of, at that time of San Francisco Opera. Because I performed quite a bit with them. Um, with um, Pavarotti and Renato Scotto, and then Shirley Verrett and Placido Domingo, and um, as guest dancer in Aida and Samson and Delilah and um, La Gioconda. So, I mean, I was in and out of that. And then they asked me to choreograph, um, well, originally it had been Margot Sappington, my friend Margot Sappington, in Canada. And I was assisting Margot. And Margot had done that version, a version, her version in Canada with Elisabetta Soderstrom. And then Lotfi left Canada to come to San Francisco. And then he wanted to do his production of Merry Widow. And Margot was not available. So she recommended me. And um, so I, I got to do it. And then Tina felt that she was this, um, she'd been this French musical, but nothing had, but she would have been fabulous in that. That you know? was funny. It was a funny thing. Yeah. What, what, it would have been amazing had she done that as well, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh my God. And then this is Rhonda in 1993. So, because this was just before the last time I saw Tina in Toulouse. Um, I was in, I was doing costumes in Roubaix in France. And um, Margot Sappington, the choreographer, and myself um, were hoping, we knew that that um, Bettina was going to be in, in Toulouse. And we were hoping, because it was the end of our stay in Roubaix, and if I didn't hear from Rhonda or Tina or anybody, that, um, you know, that then I would go back to New York. And so we were waiting for this letter from from um, from Toulouse. <clears throat> so before that, to let the people in Toulouse know, I had written to Rhonda. Rhonda writes back, says, Dear Christian, it was a nice surprise to hear from you. It sounds like you have been doing very well. I'm sure your opening was fantastic. I'm not sure what that was. Con oh, that would have been in Roubaix. Congratulations. Hearing that made me very proud of you. I guess you have been very busy. I'm not traveling with Tina any longer, so unfortunately I won't see your smiling face. I have passed your name on to the management representative, Roxana Ashton. I don't know the situation there, so unfortunately I cannot be of much help. Sorry about that. I'm still working with Tina, but I'm not on the tour. Good luck. It is a fantastic show as usual. I know you will enjoy it. I look forward to seeing you if you ever come to LA Keep in touch, all the best. Kindest regards, Rhonda. And then she says, please excuse this mismatched, mismatched stationery. So that was lovely. Wow, that is so interesting that she's so open about, or uh, that was during one of the times that she was not yeah. working with Tina because there were a couple of times when were either, well, they didn't, she didn't bring Rhonda along. Yeah. And I yeah. think Eddie said that she even fired yeah. her at one point and then, hired her again but more as roger, as a roger, personal yeah. assistant really yeah. and that was how she worked for her uh, yeah because for... roger roger wanted new blood you know but then she still when she could she fed ronda in and ultimately ronda do you was think still, it w was it was there friction between roger and ronda or was it i mean because they were working together basically in a way but roger took over and did the whole i think he know, needed it to i think it needed it he needed it to be his game with his people. And she was part of the past. She was too much part of the past, you know. So while they were in Europe, if she was in New York, that's fine, you know. And, and, but to be part of that with Tina, you know, I think he didn't care for that. I think it was being, um, what do you call that, territorial? You know, I mean, he just wanted, 
you know, he wanted control. Um, but the wonderful thing was, so we were like for the last couple of days in Hubei, we were waiting. We thought, oh, no, we haven't heard. We're not going to go. We're not going to go to Toulouse. And then there was all of a sudden the um, artistic director of the company came into rehearsal. We were in rehearsal or, she, we, yeah, we were rehearsing, came into the rehearsal. And she said, um, <clears throat> Christian, Christian, I have received for you a telex from Toulouse. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, so we were, impersonations. Uh, so I went, oh my God. So Margot and I just hugged and did a little Tarantella together. And we um, we booked a uh, wagon lit, you know, railway to go down to Toulouse. And um, that was the last time I saw her. I bumped into Lejeune and Anne and Berenger in um, like the marketplace in the, in the Place. Just before, by coincidence? Before. But by the performance, because we we were there in the afternoon, we we checked into a very cheap hotel by the um, Terminus, Terminus, you know. So we were there, and we were just we had time to kill, and I think they had time to kill. And so it was just a coincidence, yeah. That, and that like, you met them you know, there, yeah. So Edna went, I went, oh, the June is it? Oh, well, uh, see you later. And this was and, certainly and, this was on her foreign affair tour in 1990. It was one well, this this letter from when nineteen ninety three is from Rhonda. Yeah, but Rhonda, the Toulouse, yeah, but that, that would have been on her What's Love tour, which was the American leg of the Foreign Affair tour. She actually had the same uh, costumes on, uh, but just okay. with a shorter wig. But in Toulouse, that was on the Foreign Affair tour in 1990, where she still had Le Shun and Annie on. But then when she returned, she went to America to promote the What's Love movie in 93. Uh, she oh, had the two okay. twins, so that's when this Karen and Sharon, on the That's on the when tour. the letter is from. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> because... because I do know Rhonda was on the 1990 tour, tour so it was probably a few years later, you probably you tried okay. to, to uh, contact her again. So we went, the person I had to contact um, was Jenny, Jenny Bolton. Yes, her, and, her assistant as well. Polite, professional. I mean, I didn't get to, I didn't know her. She was a name I I looked up and she was very nice and she got me backstage. And of course it was an arena. So I went with Margot and we had our ticket. And so, and I have such a bad sense of direction. So to go backstage, I'm the sort of person I'd come out and instead of turning right, I'd turn left. You know, or if I, I think, okay, so um, if I, my instinct is to turn left, so I should really turn right, and then no, it was left. You know, I'm, I'm that sort of person. So with the usher, we got to our seat, and in French, as best I could, I let her know that I was going back to meet Tina and that I might be a little late coming back to my seat but please look out for me. And she said, yeah, bien sûr, bien sûr, monsieur, et cetera, et cetera. So I went down. I mean, I almost had to drop breadcrumbs because, you know, there's so many different entrances in an arena and to get backstage. So I got, I got there and I met Jenny. She met me and she put me to sit at, um, by the concession. So there's a table filled with food and stuff and I'm waiting. And <clears throat> finally, she says, okay, Tina can see you now. So I get up and I follow her. And we walk through this labyrinth and we get into a little dressing room area. It's big. And she's standing up and she has on the, the little metal short dress and the hair's out. And I'm seeing her from the back and she's doing her makeup. She says, I'll be with you in a minute, Chris. You know, so she's so she puts that down. She says, Okay, let's see the eyes. Yeah, they're clear. Oh, you're doing okay. That was the first thing. First what? thing. That Take was us through that again. What was that about? 
less because she could tell by looking at someone's eyes how they uh, what their what state what state their soul was in what state their being was in oh so from the, a that, spiritual uh, yeah clairvoyant kind of point of view yeah or or what so, that, so that's the first thing she said you know okay you know boom lips hair dress you just okay let's see the eyes that's the first thing and she said yeah they're clear oh things are going great is everything good? she said i'm sorry i can't spend much more time with you but i have to and i remember i said how is everyone everyone's fine i said it's craig so everyone's fine she you know she didn't want anything personal she had to go because now i realized she'd been chanting for an hour you know and um was ready to go on stage and she fit me in for three or four minutes she said um jenny give christian the um the address in limiston street in london because i was still living in new york um but i could send things there was they had a little office which actually is only maybe a 15 minute walk from where i am in london now it's in chelsea um and she lived in london at that time at in, in notting yeah. hill so there was all, all of that going on. And then I followed her out. And then the entourage, Lejeune and Annie and some of the band members were meeting up in the corridor. And then they became a sort of phalanx all together. And I said, God bless Tina. I'm rooting for you. She said, OK, Chris, good. And they kissed, we kissed each other. And I ran, ran as quickly as I could back. And I found the right entrance up. And I joined Margot just as she was coming down the stairs. The staircase, <laughs> the UFO yeah. that turned Just into... as she was coming, just as she was coming down the stairs, I got to my seat. And wow. that's the first time I saw her. <clears throat> she was, uh, and although I did see, I saw her at the book signing and she told me to, um, I just queued up. You know, and because um, she was just one after another, I said, "Hi, Tina, it's Chris." Oh, she said. I said, "I've read it." She said, you didn't cry, did you? I said, "No, Tina. I'm just so proud and happy for you." And she said, "She said, you said, um, um, you can reach me at Morgan's. Morgan's was the sort of boutique hotel." And I tried, and the person to contact his name was Rusty. He was working on the. He was working with with Tina at that time in production. Um, and I did leave a message, but it didn't happen. Um, so there were all these wonderful things. Why didn't you try and see her again, or when she did went on the Wildest Dreams tour, or what? Because, I mean, that was a lot of years. Because security kept changing, and people didn't know who I was, and it was too hard to get to Tina. Roger knew me. But I didn't want to feel like I'm pounding on the castle door. You know, I didn't want that. <clears throat> so she had become a little bit more um I couldn't get bloated, to it. obscure and because I was I was thrilled with your story um about figuring out with Brian Adams and dashing back to the hotel. Oh, you saw that the, and waiting in the back door, you know. You know, yes. it, was, it was that sort of thing, but I couldn't. That, that was that door that opened for me, you know. But I, yeah. I, it was like, like that because I just knew. And then she rolled down the window, and Roger yeah. was there, and and Tina, and everything. So that that was how it was by coincidence. I didn't, um, or... When she played, she played um, Radio City Music Hall. Yeah, and I had a party. I had um, an invitation to a reception afterwards, and at that time, I didn't. It, I didn't know that she left the stage, got into a limo and went right away. <clears throat> I thought I would still like at the Ritz. I thought after the show, if I'm early enough, I'd meet Roger, I'd be taken back and I'd meet her. I didn't know she'd already have left the building. <clears throat> yeah, and she did that on those tours all yeah. since the so Wild Streams I could tour. Never, she just went had, straight out to the limo and then yeah. she was off. So it had to be before, which was a whole different setup. Yeah. And it was just too much. It was just too much, you know, and to have to go through that each time because people kept changing. Somebody who was so important, who staged her image for a while. I mean, you did the the costumes and became friends and all that. 
that suddenly uh, you could not get to her. I mean, she was she yeah. had become that big, obviously, and that distant from. I, under, I think I, I understood. I understood. Um, I mean, I knew that she loved me. I didn't have anything to prove. It would have been lovely to have spent time. It would have been lovely. But to go through all of that, and I was working. You know, I had, I had a career. You know, I wasn't all. It was. It was. You know, I couldn't always take time off to get to. You know, to do all that. So it was. Um, I just did let you it miss go. those interactions? I mean, a lot of people yeah. suddenly didn't see her because she was. Then she was with Urban Bach, and she got married and moved to Europe and yeah. was there, and she didn't really see a lot of people. For yeah. so many years, it's not like she was, I, yeah. uh, she was, I was, she was sorry. a family I, person, you know what I mean? Yeah, I was sorry that I wasn't able to go to the wedding. I was, you know, that I, that I, I lamented. Um, and then to see Rhonda as maid of honor after all this, you know, it was just, it was so beautiful. And to see the look on Rhonda's face, you know, in the articles, and it was like, Oh my goodness! I I saw Erwin once at um, Madison Square Garden when she was playing. I could have approached him, but having been a performer on stage, dealing with the public, it, you're in a different mind. You know, it's and you have to go on, and you have to. You know, it's not. I mean, if, you know, if I were Beyonce, if I were like when Grace Jones came on, you know, something like that, because then you go through your PA, et cetera, your representative, and it's all arranged, et cetera. I didn't have that, you know. So it would have always been trying to prove who I was, and the message might not have got to her anyway. You know, they might say, oh, well, we'll you know, And you didn't feel like approaching Irwin? He didn't look very approachable, or? Irwin? Yeah. Um, he was buying a drink because um, I was pretty far down front and there was there was a setup where you could buy drinks and things and he was sort of hovering back and forth. I knew who he was. I could have given him my card. Something told me not to do it. Because then it's a whole spiel, you know, and you have to and he might have taken the card and put it in his pocket and forgotten, or he might have said, "Oh God, it's another one." You know, I mean, you just I didn't, and I didn't know him, and I couldn't read him, so I didn't. So I I chose that part of me chose not to venture any further. Um, but I, you know, I know that at the very end I was in her thoughts because this wonderful fellow um, Taro Gold who co-wrote um, Happiness Becomes You with her. Oh, um, yeah, this... Um... He's lovely. He's... Um, he's um, I don't, I've never met him. We know each other. We've exchanged emails and we've... Oh, it's all these signs. When I heard, because I'm on Instagram, when I heard that Rhonda had died, it affected me. Well, first of all, in the... Not the interview you did with her. She still looked fine. But in the documentary, and oh, you know, she's not in the in the last documentary. Oh, yes. She looked so thought, frail and so oh, skinny. And, no, and she did not no. look well. So, I, you know, I could, I sensed that. And then I heard that she had um, passed. And I was on Instagram. And um, someone had written a post and I had liked it, so there was a, a heart, <clears throat> and then someone had liked, oh, and then I wrote something about what Rhonda meant to me, just three or four sentences, and someone had liked that, and it was Taro. And I thought, I know that, why do I know that name? I know. Then I realized who it was. And so um, I contacted him and I sent him a copy of the letter from Rhonda and et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and we both practice, you know, so all of that. So, And he was very, he's been very, very, very sweet, very sweet. And um, some of the photographs that I sent you, he had asked if I could forward them to him 
because Tina was putting together for her own personal use, for her own personal satisfaction, a collection of all the things she ever did, etc. And she wanted um, some of images of the dresses that I made. So I, and then like a month later, she was gone. So, but she got those. So I know that I was in her in her thoughts. And when I was going, I've directed my first short film, um, which is, we're just out of post-production and we're going to have a couple of screenings later in the, in the month. And the production company is in Milan. And um, I thought, okay, well, I'll be in Milan. So Milan, okay, Eurostar to Zurich. I bet I could, you know, I bet I could, I bet I could do it. And so I asked Taro, would he mind terribly if, because um, you don't want to just pounce. I'm very, you know, I'm very um, cognizant of that because I don't want to use people. I don't want to think, oh, you know, that's a stepping stone because that's not, that wasn't it. You know, that wasn't it. So I really thought about it. I said, Tara, if it's not an imposition, next time you speak to Tina, could you just let her know that I sent her my love? And um, I'm going to be in Milan and I'm wondering if perhaps I could, you know, pass by Zurich and and, and meet her. He said, oh, well, you know, um, it's possible, you know, but of course the only person, she isn't seeing anybody, the only person she's seen is Cher, but, I, but I'll pass on the message. And he did. And I got the message back that it would have been lovely, lovely to, to, um, to spend time together, but it's just not possible at this time. And so that didn't work out and then but she got my costume designs and uh, and then the next thing she was gone she was very and, sick at the end and probably way way more ill than we oh of course to believe obviously of course of course and that's when the whole universe started just revolving for me um, because it was so profound. The loss was so profound. It's been like that and, for all of us. And I didn't know what to, I couldn't process it because it was a mixture of, it was a mixture of celebrating her life. There was joy in her accomplishments. There was the loss, there was pain, there, and it was all this, this cocktail that just set me spinning. Uh, and I've said this publicly, and, and I've spoken to many people about it. We didn't get any closure. You know, no. there were no no mention of a funeral service, no. memorial service, a concert no. tribute concert with other artists. No. There were no uh, mention of how is Irvin doing or yeah. when did she actually pass? Did she choose to do that exit thing that they yeah. that possibility they have in in, in Switzerland or what yeah. was actually going on? She was just. She just died and then left with nothing. And yeah. why did the press not? That's the first time ever that the press did not try to find out. It's almost like they have a deal with the press saying, don't talk about this. Because yeah. usually the press don't, you know, they just don't, they're, they're, they don't shy away of yeah. anything trying to yeah. find details. Yeah. I just find a little bit, we're left with nothing. There's a lot of colleagues, friends, fans who were loyal throughout the years. And mm. we don't get anything. Do you think we'll get that at some point? It'll I doubt that's factory. I doubt or... it. I doubt it. It was a double whammy because earlier in the year we lost um, Daisaku Ikeda, who had been the president of SGI. And I've only known, I mean, I never met him. I did write to him, I got a response. But he was always this presence. He was always this presence. And we had always speculated, well, what happens when he's gone? Because it's the three founding presidents. You know, it's Makaguchi, it's Toda, and then it's Ikeda. And so what happened? And then we were told, you know, well, basically, then it's us, you know, because now it's millions of people. And um, when we when we got the news that, that he had passed, that was sort of being thrown into the universe a little, because there was a void, you know. Um, and it was up to us, and we had to rally with our faith and go forward. And then when Wayne died... Wayne Shorter. Yeah, when Wayne Shorter died, um, I mean, we didn't correspond all the time, but I spent some, I spent a lovely evening with him in his dressing room. 
And his mother's name was Louise and my grandmother's, my, my father's side, um, her name was Louise. And we spoke about Louise's and it was really, and then Carolina has been wonderful. Um, and then it turned out that, that the drummer in the group he was, that played with him had been in the pit with the Joffrey Ballet back in 1970, whatever, when we were doing the ballet called Trinity, that the, the Tina saw. So it always said, Chris, that's for me. Weren't you in the, oh my God, you know, it was one of those. So all of this happening. Um, so it's been that it, it 20, 2023 was a tough year. It's a tough and year it, for all of us. Oh on many, my on God. Many levels, on many levels, but certainly this tribute series I'm doing here with about yeah. Tina and her legacy is of course amazing. We can really go in depth. We've done it yeah. now so for four hours. Has and it been? It, and it's like yourself. unbelievable. The time time flies. And I hope people will will take the yeah. time or find the time to look at, look through this whole interview and 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 all of your amazing stories and yeah. accounts and just just and just how you took us through a lot of experiences. It was it's a privilege. It's a privilege. Just just before I sign off, um, this was the um, when Ruff came out and we were in that dressing room. Aline was there. Uh, Michael sister. Peters, yeah, Michael Peters had danced um, in place of me, you know. So I went to see that, and we'd hung out, and it was really lovely. And Ruff came out, and she signed the album for me which is, you know, you can sort of see there, which is, um, there we go. You know, it's nice. And then in the inside, she signed, except she used ballpoint pen. And it's really hard. You can see how the indentation, you know, you can see the, ind oops, you can see the indentation where she has written. Um, but it's it's almost legible unless you really look at it closely. And what she says is... You have to take a picture of it to save it. Yeah. Um, she says, um, Chris, this album is the beginning of the autumn of my life. I know you'll be a part one day. Love, Tina. Isn't that gorgeous? Wow. Isn't that gorgeous? That's interesting that she talks about that being her her autumn i mean Beginning, if only yeah. she she knew what was in store for her huh yeah i it's mean my just, god it's just on so many levels so i mean she affected me personally as a friend and professionally including design and learning from her seeing the technique and all the various shows and the technique behind her shows and how nothing Everything that seemed spontaneous wasn't. It was rehearsed down every single thing and eyes in the back of her head and who's doing what in the band and the, the arrangements and, you know, all of that in the moment to learn from that. And then spiritually to have been given, you know, this gift that is sort of, that keeps me buoyant, you know, that is... And she's on my, um, I can't show you, but she's on my little altar. I have the photograph of myself with her there. So my parents are there. Tina's on that side. And then the three presidents, um, SGI presidents are in the middle. And um, huge, 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 um, universal, cosmic, um, to have come from nothing, you know, because that is true enlightenment, really, you know, because and also her... Tina had that. Isn't it true, Christian? Mm. Tina had that special thing, that certain something that a lot of that stands out. She stood out. She was she's not like anybody mm. else. And you can't really compare her. And it's it's no. the, it's the look and, and it's the personality. But as I always say, it's something that comes from within and you just cannot pin it down. But it's something. No otherworldly in a way yeah. and she was unusual so it's it's a void because we're, we're connecting with her differently you had this great amazing opportunity to 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 be a costume designer for her and a mm. friend and somebody mm. that she also valued so you had mm. something very special very special that 
that only you will you have with with her and that's one amazing yeah. but i mean and, she did touch that thing inside of all of us yeah and one was always aware that she was enlightened i mean she hasn't changed that much you know towards the end she didn't change that much the the core of who she was remained the same i mean she got grander she got you know she got the perks and all of that but the core of who the the anime in her remained the same and that was an enlightened being because she came up basically not that differently from ike ike didn't make it ike was not enlightened he got sucked he could never get out of the mud. She got out of the mud and became this beautiful lotus. And probably yeah. she became even more anime again as she progressed and retired and had to fight illnesses and had yeah. to certainly humble herself uh, because, you know, her body was her temple and yeah. her body was what created the star and all the work that we so love. So, um, so and, it was yeah, a and she, she even said, 10 years for her. Yeah. She even said, I think in one of, it's in the documentary, I think the last documentary, she said, you know, no, I'm, I'm not frightened about, you know, she said, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've done what I came here to do. You know, she, it was like, she'd done it and it had, she'd been able to teach and, uh, you know, with, um, she had done everything she had planned, she had done everything. everything. She released whatever she needed to release in terms of books and in terms of the documentary, the, the Broadway mu mu musical and, and everything. She really and she found love. everything. And, and she, she found love. Yeah. I mean, wow. 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 But I what mean, an amazing I... story, Christian. It's been absolutely amazing. This is, I mean, oh, this Lucas. was, uh, I mean, I'm a bit <laughs> astounded or flabbergasted that we did four hours, but we wow. actually did, and it was uh, it was quite quite extraordinary. And I want to tell you that I really enjoyed it, and I thank you so much Good. for sharing well, this, thank you for this the with me, yeah. but also with all of the viewers. Thank Good. you so much, Christian Holder. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you for the opportunity. God bless. Thank you. Just little did you know, Lucas. No, little, little did I know, did but I suspect. love. I have absolutely loved every moment, oh, and yes. you could and you could carry on. And I think this is so amazing. And we got to meet also when I'm in London. And do you ever come? Week. Do you do you come over? Do you pass? Oh, I, well, I usually do. I haven't been there for a few years, but usually I come back and forth many times a year. That'd but, be lovely. But I I'm, haven't I'm been sure there. I'm sure we'll meet. I'm sure we'll meet. We have to. We have to definitely. We Lovely. must, and you're also always welcome in Denmark. Lovely. But I mean, of course, uh, I will. I will come. It's not difficult to go to London, and I have many friends there. I, I love London, like my second Lovely. home. So it's great. Lovely. So and how uh, does one say? Is it? Um, <laughs> how do you say? See you um, till next time. See you. Says neset. Vices. 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 Okay. Vices. Not. I'll Be see you snot. soon. Be say snot. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's the Danish way. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, Christian. I Great. really enjoyed it. How amazing. How wonderful it. it has been. God bless. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Christian Holder for appearing on my show, The Lucas Alexander Show, and sharing his amazing adventures and experiences with Tina Turner. And thanks to all of you for watching my special tribute series, Remembering the Queen of Rock. Your support is greatly appreciated, so please like my videos, subscribe to my channel, and hit the bell for notifications. Thank you, and I'll see you again soon.